like dim yeah. green. There we go. All right, ready to call the next matter. We are on the record in the uh, Carol Davis matter, sorry, in the petition for early termination of probation of Carol Davis. The Office of Administrative Hearings number for this matter is 2022-100197. Uh, the case number for this matter is 6002022000045. Uh, may I take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General, please? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Colin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a little gray button at the bottom there. No, oh, there we go. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Kyle of Cassiar from the Office of the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon. And may I have the appearance of the petitioner, if you could state your name for the record? Mm -hmm. Try that again. Carol A. Davis. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And good morning. And uh, will all the members of the board please identify themselves for the record? Dr. Cheryl Kasuga, board member. Julie Nystrom, board member. And Dr. Stephen Phillips, board member. Dr. Leah Tate, board president. Sarah, <coughs> excuse me. Siron Fu, board vice president. Dr. Shakanda Rogers, board member. Dr. Maricela Cervantes, board member. Dr. Mary Harbsheets, board member. Ana Rescate, board member. All right, it appears we have a quorum present. My name is Ed Washington. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I have been assigned to hear this matter. Um, Dr. Davis, you are self-represented today, correct? Correct. All right, so I'm going to go through some quick instructions that we provide to individuals that are self-represented. Uh, the first thing I want to note is that we were scheduled to have a court reporter here today to take down everything that is being stated. However, we were unable to secure a court reporter for today's proceedings. Mm -hmm. um, we do, as an alternative, have an electronic recording device. And if a transcript is ever ordered, we can use this electronic uh, recording to create a transcript. Um, if it's requested by either party. Are you willing to consent to electronic recording of today's proceedings? Yes. All right, thank you. And so, um, as I mentioned, um, I am an employee of the Office of Administrative Hearings. They are a state entity, I'm a state employee, but my role here is completely independent. Is that understood? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, in terms of how today's proceedings will proceed, um, the Deputy Attorney General will make a presentation of your history and essentially what led us to the discipline um, against your license. You will then have the opportunity to present your case. Um, we have all reviewed the petition, so you don't have to necessarily give us a line-by-line -line recitation of the information you have presented. But what I encourage you to do is focus on those um, components of your presentation that you believe are the most persuasive. Understood? Yes. <laughs> all right. Once that occurs, the Deputy Attorney General will have the opportunity to ask questions, as will the board. And when that is concluded, we will return to you to see if you have anything additional to add that may have come to mind based on the questions that you were asked. Understood? Yes. Okay. A couple of other things, too. Because this matter is being electronically recorded, it's important that we follow a couple of basic rules. We want to be sure that we speak one at a time and don't speak over each other. It's common in every, everyday conversation to do that from time to time because you can anticipate what the other person is going to say. But it's impossible to take down a clear recording of two people speaking at once. So be sure you wait till the question is complete before you provide a response, and we will all do our best to make sure we wait until your response is complete before asking you the next question. Understood? Yes. Okay. And I've noticed during our interaction so far, you've also nodded your head a few times. We want to avoid nods and shakes of the head because those things cannot be recorded, and we want to avoid sounds like, uh-huh, uh-uh, mm-hmm, and mm -hmm, for the same reason. Understood? Yes. Okay. Any questions for me? None. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So with that said, I'm uh, ready to begin. You may present your uh, background information council. Thank and you, Your exhibits. Members of the board. I'm Deputy Attorney General Kalev Cassiaro on behalf of the Office of the Attorney General in the state of California. And my appearance here today is pursuant to government code section 11522. We have a petition for early termination of probation from Dr. Carol Ann Davis, and I'm going to give a brief timeline of events that 
both preceded the accusation in this matter and then the immediate events for the accusation and the stipulated settlement and discipline order. So on April 21st of 2000, the petitioner was convicted of one count of violating California Vehicle Code Section 23152, Subdivision A, driving while under the influence of alcohol and drugs, as well as Vehicle Code Section 23538, Subdivision B2, which is an enhancement for a blood alcohol level in excess of 20%. Both of these were misdemeanors. Imposition of criminal sentence was suspended, and the petitioner was fined and placed on three years of informal probation with various conditions. This conviction was expunged on or about September 13th of 2012. On March 13th, 2015, petitioner was convicted of petty theft in the Los Angeles Superior Court, arising from a shoplifting incident on or about December 16th of 2014. In possession of, I'm sorry, imposition of sentence in this matter was suspended and petitioner was fined and placed on probation for 12 months. This conviction was expunged on or about April 30th of 2018. On August 18th of 2018, petitioner caused an automobile accident by rear-ending another vehicle on the freeway. The petitioner had to be driven off the highway by the responding CHP officer. The CHP officer smelled the odor of alcohol on her breath. A breath test provided a 0.15 blood alcohol content result. The investigating officers concluded that the cause of the collision was petitioner's excessive speed combined with her impairment by alcohol. She was arrested. On September 24th of 2018, Petitioner was convicted of violation of California Vehicle Code Section 23152, subdivision B, driving with a blood alcohol level above 0.08%. This was a misdemeanor, and this conviction was result as a, of a no low contender plea by petitioner. She received a suspended sentence, was fined, spent four days in the Los Angeles County Jail, and followed by 48 months of criminal probation with various conditions. On November 21st of 2018, the accusation based on the underlying September 24th motor vehicle accident was filed. That petition included the other three counts uh, that I've enumerated from April of 2000, the other DUI 2015, the shoplifting, and then of course the 2018 motor vehicle collision. On July 12th of 2019, the petitioner entered into a stipulated settlement and there was an order in this matter that became effective on July 12th. The petitioner was given four years of probation. There were various conditions to that probation. Um, when it's my case in chief, I will get into more of the status, but currently Dr. Davis is in compliance, has met all of the conditions up to date and is current with the ongoing conditions. She has had five violations of probation, and I will get into those uh, further. And then on July 12th of 20, I'm sorry, January 4th of 2022, petitioner filed for early termination, and her probation currently has not told, and she has a projected completion date if there is no early termination of July 12th of 2023. Moving to the exhibits, and petitioner does have a copy of all of the unredacted exhibits. I would start with exhibit one is the notice of hearing in this matter. Administratively, I would just note that the notice of hearing that is in everyone's binder was a subsequent notice of hearing. The address has changed, but um, that would only come up if it was notice and petitioner had not appeared today. So if your honor wants, I have the amended copy for the official file, but as petitioners here, there's no notice issue, but I just want to point that out that the location in that exhibit is incorrect. It was uh, modified after the exhibits were submitted. I'm satisfied with the uh, version that you provided considering the petitioner is here today. Thank you, Your Honor. Exhibit number two is the certificate of licensure. Exhibit three is the certified decision and order in this matter. Exhibit four is the certified citation order issued by the board. Exhibit five is the certified accusation in this matter. 
Exhibit 6 is petitioner's petition for early termination, and that includes all of the attachments petitioner attached to her petition. Exhibit number seven is the probation report in this matter. Number eight is rather voluminous. It is all of petitioner's probation file from her entire time being on probation in this matter. And then exhibits nine through 12 are jurisdictional documents. Exhibit nine is the California Business and Professions Code section 2962, which deals with reinstatement and modification of penalty petitions. Exhibit 10 is the California Code of Regulations, section 1395, discussing the rehabilitation criteria. Exhibit number 11 is California Code of Regulations, section 1395.1, rehabilitation criteria for suspensions or revocations of licenses. And exhibit number 12 is the California Government Code, section 11522, uh, which deals with my appearance here today. And that is the entirety of our exhibits, Your Honor. All right, thank you. And are you requesting that all these exhibits be admitted into evidence? I would request that all these exhibits be admitted into evidence. Okay, one clarification. I believe you said exhibits 9 through 12, you want it to be admitted for jurisdictional purposes. They appear to be statutes and or regulations. Do you want me to just take official notice of those documents? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So, Dr. Davis, um, courts are allowed to take official notice of things that aren't, the short ex explanation is things that are not reasonably within dispute. One example I like to give is that Christmas Day is on December 25th, or that today is a Thursday, something of that nature. Um, it also can include um, precedential decisions, court rulings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what counsel has requested is that I take official notice of exhibits nine through 12, which appear to be uh, portions of the Business and Professions Code uh, relative to this case. Uh, do you have any objection to me taking official notice of these documents, essentially agreeing that they are what they appear to be? Um, yes, however, there's one clarification on my history. The date is incorrect, so if I may. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, I just um, And I appreciate that, so mm -hmm. sort of bookmark it, but I'm referring specifically to exhibits 9, 10, 11, and 12. Yes, understood. Mm -hmm. Okay, and have you had a chance to take a look at those? Yes. Any objection to me taking official notice of those documents, i.e. recognizing that they are what they appear to be? No objection. Okay, so official notice is taken of exhibits 9 through 12. And I'm sorry, you had a concern about one of the other exhibits. Can you raise that now? Um, it was just a notation of my first DUI. It did not occur in 2000. I would have been 16 years old. It occurred in 2009. Okay, so I believe you're referring to the background information he provided. Hang on rather than a specific document? Correct. Okay. So what will happen is you will have the opportunity to testify. You can explain or clarify any information that's been provided that you believe is incomplete or incorrect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So with respect to the remainder of the documents, um, and I want to be sure you've had the chance to take a look at them, but mm -hmm. with respect to exhibits one through eight, he's requested that these documents also be admitted to evidence, and I'd like to know if you have any objection to them. Um, if you need a minute to review them, you may. Um, I assume you've seen them before today. Yes. yes. But don't feel rushed. I just. And if you want, we can go through them one at, one at a time if that's easier. Um, there was just, I, I have it by page number. I don't have it by tab. Um, there was just two pages that um, aren't part of my file. It was erroneously put in my file. It was an individual that has the same last name as me. So I just wanted to ensure it's it's sort of irrelevant. It's an email correspondence, but it was someone else's email correspondence. Right. Then it would be important for us to know what document that is. So yes. if you have it handy. So, um, or in what exhibit? You saw it. Um, in Exhibit 8, page 194 and 195, it's a different Dr. Davis. Okay, so I believe you're stating that Exhibit 8, page 194 and 195 relate to someone other than yourself? 
Correct. All right. You have a position on that, Council? I'm reviewing the document now. No objection. These were unmodified, and I agree with Dr. Davis that this these were part of the official file, but they seem to have been misfiled by the enforcement analyst. Okay. Well, considering that, then um, are you comfortable with me withdrawing those two pages from this exhibit? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So just so the record is clear, pages AGO 194 and 195 of Exhibit 8 have been withdrawn. Do you have any additional objections, um, Dr. Davis, to Exhibits 1 through 8? No, I don't. All right. Hearing no objection, Exhibits 1 through 8 are admitted into evidence as described. And you may continue, Counsel, if you have additional information at this time. Not at this time, Your Honor. All right. So, Dr. Davis, now is your opportunity to present any evidence um, that you have. I believe you stated earlier that you don't have any additional documents um, in addition to what you've already provided. Uh, do you have any additional witnesses you intend to call other than yourself? No. Okay. Are you ready to testify at this time? Yes. All right. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you provide today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Um, just quickly, if you had retained an attorney, they would ask you questions to elicit whatever um, information you felt was supportive of your case. What I generally tell people to represent themselves is just tell us what you want us to know, but be sure that you focus again on those things that you believe are the most important and most persuasive with respect to your rehabilitation and essentially support why you feel you should um, be released from the restrictions that you have. All right? All right. Thank Maybe you. Begin when ready. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to revisit the clarification since this is now uh, the open time for this. Uh, my first DUI was in the year 2009, not 2000. So just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank everyone for taking the time to be here and for the opportunity to attend this hearing today. In consideration of this matter, I have acknowledged my wrongdoing and lapse in judgment. I take full responsibility for my decisions that led to the disciplinary action, and I continue to hold myself accountable for my behaviors. I have maintained over three years and 10 months of sobriety with no relapses, and I take pride in my sober lifestyle. I would like to share some of the clarity and insights I have gained about my past behavioral patterns I've come to realize that throughout my adulthood, I tended to normalize chronic stress, push myself to depletion or exhaustion, and did not utilize enough healthy outlets and support for my problems as they arose. In turn, I repeated the cycle in which I set my expectations too high, judged my process, lacked self-compassion, perceived my setbacks as failures, then shut down or was self-disparaging for not doing as well as I expected. Likewise, I tended to not initially express very difficult emotions prompted by situations like interpersonal conflict and loss, and instead internalized and attempted to avoid the inevitable impact of such stressors. Although I had some good coping skills in place, the accumulation and compound effect of my stressors and suppressed emotions led me to resort to maladaptive coping strategies. Ultimately, my misconduct materialized from a series of unresolved stressors, pain, and insufficient coping. Since then, I have learned to break the cycle of poor coping strategies when faced with adversity. And I have embarked on the steps to unlearning negative habits and learn better skills in order to become a more authentic self. As part of my rehabilitation process, I have processed through several complex emotions, remorse, shame, grief, anger, confusion. One aspect that has contributed to my ongoing sobriety is my increasing openness and vulnerability about my struggles and status and the ability to remain receptive to other people and to my environment. I believe that I particularly showed progress in my rehabilitation at two points in my recent past. The first of which occurred in late 2019 when I chose to disclose all that I had done and the outcomes of my actions to two close friends who also work in the mental health field. 
For over one year from the time of the incident, I did not share any of this with friends due to shame, regret, and fear of judgment. Thus, my decision to share this was a big step in my rehabilitation. Secondly, in April to May 2021, I experienced three significant life-changing events within a three-week period, all amidst the pandemic as well. Specifically, I chose to end a long-term relationship. I did not pass my licensure exam, and I had a hysterectomy. Through all this, I was reminded of my inner strength, courage, and intuition to withstand such events and still move forward with peace and sobriety. In fact, I recall telling myself and others, if I can stay positive and sober through all this, I can make it through anything. Overall, I feel I've developed a healthier state of mind and I continuously utilize outlets and positive coping skills, such as therapy, AA meetings, speaking to and sharing with friends and family, exercise, healthy eating, adequate sleep, journaling, reading, mindfulness, and I enjoy hobbies such as cooking, staying active, and listening to music. I'm also grateful for my protective factors, such as the support from family, my boss, and my current relationship. Subsequently, I'm more present and engaged to be of service to others at work, and I have more realistic and compassionate self-views. As Brene Brown eloquently stated, quote, only when we are only when we know our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. Compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity, end quote. I genuinely feel I have met my rock bottom, faced the darkness, and chose to learn from it and build myself back up in order to be a better person and improved professional. Further, I want to illustrate the lessons I have learned and the harsh truths that have developed from being on probation. I resonate with the concept that we learn from failure, not from success, and this experience is no exception. I have worked on many character building assets while on probation, some of which are discussed in the AA readings. For instance, I've endured much humility through the humbling process of stepping outside of my typical day and identity in order to establish new routines and perceptions. I have strengthened my resilience by surrendering to the process and things beyond my control and learning how to adapt. I continue to exude vulnerability to myself, loved ones, peers, and even strangers. And I find this to be the most pivotal aspect that perpetuated my process of healing and rehabilitation. I also feel I exhibit perseverance by going through every step of this process and doing whatever it takes in order to demonstrate my capabilities and purpose. I feel as strongly as ever that my purpose is to serve others in the mental health profession. And my passion for health and wellness is now something I can both teach and model. I feel I am now more empathetic and relatable to real life struggles. And I can speak to the firsthand benefits of therapy. In sum, I have come to terms with my past behaviors and I accept my flaws and mistakes. Based on all I've been through and learned, I will always choose sobriety and recovery first. And I feel my actions continue to reflect that. There's also been a lot of soul searching involved in the course of the past three years and four months of probation thus far. Frankly, at the onset of probation, I initially lost some confidence and motivation as a budding professional and felt I had to prove myself at every rule I had to abide by. The irony is the process also reignited why I have fought so hard to be here, to work towards being a psychologist, and to implement the lessons I have learned. As it pertains to my misconduct, I have developed a healthy disdain towards alcohol because it has taken so much from me and has threatened everything that matters to me. It is important to know I fully acknowledge that I deserve the consequences of my actions. And any pain and suffering that I endured through this process is with this underlying truth and understanding in mind. I am grateful for the opportunity to improve myself and change my trajectory for a better future. Nonetheless, I have also experienced negative effects because of the impact of my probation terms. 
I am seeking early termination because my ongoing probation status and demands are hindering me from fully moving forward with my personal and professional goals. Unfortunately, I have also developed a certain degree of hypervigilance and anxiety about these terms. For instance, I get heart palpitations and shakiness when I receive any type of correspondence related to probation, particularly during the first year. There have been several false alarms or unexpected obstacles regarding probation terms, such as a false positive test and an erroneous self-harm risk accusation, both of which further contributed to my anxiety. I've also experienced at least weekly nightmares since the onset of the probation, particularly fears about the on-call daily check-ins and the potential for random drug testing. It should be noted I do not fear the outcomes of these tests, for I have been sober for years and I'm confident in the results. Rather, I've developed a pattern of ruminative thinking and some irrational fears about the possibility of something going wrong and then having my entire career taken away. While I understand the need for the testing terms, it has become a notable trigger and ongoing source of stress in my life because it's expensive, time-consuming, intrusive, and hinders me from fully engaging in my daily life. In fact, after my flight this morning, I went directly to a testing site before coming here today. The testing obligation has taken away my freedom to make plans without interruptions or explore other options in my schedule. I also have not been able to pursue teaching yoga more rigorously because I cannot commit to the schedule knowing I may have to cancel the test because it takes an average of two hours each time. On a more global scale, probation has been financially devastating for me. I had to continue living with family because of the required cost and I was forced to depend and burden my family longer than any of us had planned because of my financial constraints. Due to the financial strain, I have postponed my dreams of living closer to my sister and watch my young niece and nephew grow because they mean so much to me. Professionally speaking, I have been rejected by liability insurance in the past. I have been limited in my current job duties and I have been unhappy with certain aspects of my work. I have a strong desire to expand and explore other options for professional growth. However, I've been obligated to stay at my current job since I am on probation. I am blessed to have the support and understanding of my family and friends, yet I feel I am less present as a friend, family member, and partner when I have to prioritize my probation obligations over them and struggle with anxiety about it all. In conclusion, I want to help make the world a better place and I now feel equipped to provide comprehensive tools to others that I myself have used and benefited from. I have evolved to embrace the gift of sobriety, and this makes me a safer and more competent member of society and working professional. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. We'll now take questions from our Deputy Attorney General. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Davis, on April, uh, first let me start for the record, April 21st, 2009 is the correct date. I misspoke, I had it incorrectly listed. So it is correctly listed in the materials and the exhibit binders. Dr. Davis, on April 27th of 2020, you were issued a violation of probation notice in your case for failing to submit to testing on two separate occasions. Yes. <laughs> And those dates that you missed the testing were April 14th of 2020, where you checked in and you were instructed to test, but failed to test that day, correct? Correct. And the second date was April 23rd, 2020. You checked in and then you were instructed to test, but again, failed to test, correct? Correct. Then on May 1st of 2020, you were issued a violation of probation notice for failing to submit to testing on April 29th of 2020. Correct. And again, you had uh, been instructed by your monitoring organization to test when you checked in at 6.56 a.m. on that date. Correct. Then on June 23rd of 2020, you were issued a violation of probation notice due to testing positive for THC on May 19th of 2020. 
Yes. And on November 2nd of 2020, you were issued a violation of probation notice for failing to check in with your monitoring organization on October 31st of 2020. Correct. And then on March 2nd of 2021, you were issued a citation for failing to check in with your monitoring organization on October 31st, 2020 again. Correct. And you paid that citation? Yes. What is your sobriety date, Dr. Davis? January 8th, 2019. And you are an alcoholic? Yes. And you understand there's no cure? Correct. And you just testified to various stresses caused by probation? Yes. And you say that you constantly worry about what could go wrong while you're on probation, meaning within your probation enforcement? In the matter I spoke to, yes. And you experience weekly nightmares? Yes. You have heart palpitations every time you receive a probation-related call or email? Yes. And you get anxious when you see an unknown local call to your phone? No. You didn't write in your petition that you get anxious when you see an unknown local call to your phone for fear that it's the police calling again or something related to probation issues? I apologize, yes, I did say that. And even the process of completing and submitting this petition caused you some degree of stress, correct? Yes. And in fact, you postponed completing and submitting this due to that? Correct. And you believe that probation has burdened you with, well, that this probation and its conditions are a burden? I feel that they have contributed to a certain degree of um, unexpected changes in my life. But you feel that the probation is holding you back from achieving your career goals? Yes. And you feel that with regards to your personal relationship, the probation is holding you back from, I believe, moving out from living with your parents? Correct. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Counsel. Then at this point, we will take questions from the board, and we will start with President Tate. Thank you for coming and meeting with us, Dr. Davis. I just have one question. In your paperwork, um, you've documented that you have endorsed utilizing therapy in the past. Are you currently in treatment? And can you talk a little bit about that if you are? And if you're not, why not? Sure. Uh, yes, I have attended therapy on and off for a number of years um, prior to um, the incident in 2018. I was in therapy for a little over two years, um, at which point I graduated in June and um, attended, well, I had about a month off before I um, transitioned to full-time work. Uh, so I chose to terminate therapy because I was going to be attending work full-time and my primary stressor I discussed was grad school. So I felt grad school's over, stressor's over. Um, I then, um, at, when this incident occurred, I promptly returned to therapy to the same therapist until I was instructed on probation terms that I was not no longer allowed to see her. She was not a qualified mental health professional for the board terms. So I transitioned to a, another therapist. Um, I met with her for the mandated year, and then I continued thereafter um, to every other week for financial reasons. Um, I wanted to continue voluntarily. Um, it was more just um, for the cost. I chose to go every other week. Currently, I'm attending once a month, again, for financial reasons, but I do continue to see a therapist regularly. Thank you for explaining. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, Vice President Fu. 
No questions at this time. All right, Dr. Kasuga. Hi, <laughs> Dr. Davis. Um, I just have a question um, with regards to um, the erroneous um, self-harm. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so what happened is for a period because of COVID, there, were, uh, there was a time when the drug testing was done via video conference and we did oral swabs. So I would be um, speaking to somebody uh, online, face to face, for about 15 minutes or so. On uh, this particular occasion, um, there's a time from there's a set time from when they expect inspect your mouth um, to when you are allowed to start testing. So there's a time clock of about eight to 10 minutes where you have to wait and just speak and be cordial with them until you're ready to do the testing. Um, it was during that time we, I, you know, just engage in small talk. Um, you know, we're laughing. She talked about her children. She even asked me about tips on how to stay hydrated and, and how to stay energized and, and um, have good nutrition. So I, I always like health topics, so I engaged. Um, we completed the matter, um, did the testing, it was done. Um, I get a call about an hour and a half later. This is while I'm at work. Um, I had a missed call from the Monrovia Police Department saying that they were trying to locate me, that police had been sent to uh, the residence where, my, where I am and where my parents live, um, which I already thought was a little odd because they knew I was at work. Um, but it was a wellness check because the woman on um, the, at the time it was FS Solutions, I believe, um, is the drug testing site. She accused me of saying I was suicidal. Um, and I was never given any indication as for why I asked for evidence or any word or phrase or anything that might tip her off to that. And I got no feedback. So um, it was all sort of very vague, but essentially, um, that person notified my probation officer at the time, or manager at the time, uh, Curtis. He uh, then notified local police. They went out to the house. Of course, I wasn't there. My parents answered. They, in turn, you know, my stepdad had me on speaker and um, speaking directly to police saying, no, I'm not suicidal. Um, I did not endorse any form of self-harm or risk of self-harm. Um, so certainly they were just trying to do their job and, and I indicated, um, of course, I, as a mental health professional, I completely respect the precaution if someone is um, at risk of harm to self or others. Uh, however, I see there's no evidence here and I would like some explanation. Never got any explanation. So I concluded that perhaps it's just a theory because the call was made about an hour and a half after I finished the um, testing. I wondered if she confused me with somebody else, um, because if, if that is of concern, you would promptly contact somebody, and it was about an hour and a half later. Yeah. So um, that's, that's what happened. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Dr. Cervantes. I have no questions right now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sheets. Thank you for being here, Dr. Davis. I, my question was I wanted to get clearer on your sobriety date. And as I was looking at the um, testing results, it looked like there was a positive test at one time. So could you explain a little bit to me, including um, where the positive test date fell within what you considered your sobriety date? Absolutely. Um, so yes, my sobriety date is January 8th of 2019. It has now been three years and a little over 10 months. It'll be 11 months on the 8th of December. Um, the positive test you're speaking about um, noted here on May 19th, 2020. Um, this was during the time when 
oral swabs were being done via video conference um, due to COVID. So in lieu of me going into a site and providing urine samples, this was an oral swab. So, um, and there is um, pictures of this in my email correspondence. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, I um, had a hysterectomy last year. I had very extreme periods leading up to that and um, really significant um, cramps. And I would use a topical oil. Um, it does not create any kind of um, head change or high or anything like that. It's strictly topical. And it does have CBD and THC in it. Um, I use the topical ointment for that reason. Um, and I guess even though I'd washed my hands several times before the oral swab test, I guess some of it got into the end that I was holding and um, got into the vial where I used as an oral swab. Um, I once, uh, it's interesting because it says issued a violation on June 23rd and the date was May 19th. So um, my probation manager at the time, Curtis, he actually let me know. He said, the reason why I didn't call you right away is because it was an odd sort of positive. It's not like a traditional THC positive. And it's because of that. It was a topical ointment I had used for pain. I don't like taking painkillers and that was a helpful remedy at the time. So my sobriety date is still January 8th of 2019. Um, with no relapses, including marijuana. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Member Nystrom. No questions. Thank you. All right, Dr. Phillips. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I had a few questions. Um, you've called that a false positive test, but it was a positive test, right? Uh, yes, not for THC in my system, but residue from a, a product, yes. You're certain that the THC didn't get into your system? Correct. It is not transdermal. Patches um, are transdermal. This is an ointment similar to a lotion. It does not get into the system. Um, you said you chose not to have a sponsor in AA. Could you explain that? Yes. I appreciate you bringing this up. Um, so at the time of um, leading up to my actual sobriety date, um, I had experienced shortly after uh, my DUI in 2018, um, unfortunately, I lost my father due to alcoholism and um, struggled a lot with that, certainly. And um, nonetheless, I tried to push through to um, take my licensure exam in December 2019. I felt um, pretty overwhelmed and busy with studying and grieving, so I decided to wait um, on that front. In January, when um, I did meet my sobriety date, when I started, um, I, everyone calls it white knuckling it through <laughs> sobriety. And um, that wasn't the case for me. I sort of had made that decision. This is it. And um, this is a change in lifestyle. From there, 2019, I was studying again for, in an attempt to take a test a second time. Um, I was supposed to take it around April or May. I rescheduled to December. So I felt once I was done with this test, I was going to be able to focus on um, having a sponsor. Fast forward um, by end of 2019, unfortunately I did not pass my licensure exam for a second time. Um, in early 2020, um, I essentially had decided I was going to move ahead with the 12 steps and with a sponsor. However, then COVID happened and shutdowns and um, people were available by phone, but I really preferred in person. So throughout all that time of um, not having a sponsor per se, I was still attending AA every week. Also, I used, it's in the back of the exhibits, um, I used two self-reflection journals. Each day, there's sort of a, a question that it's posed um, that requires you know, some element of self-reflection. And um, so I utilized that sort of in lieu of a, of a daily check-in with the sponsor. Um, secondly, I 
I do, I did initially have some reservations about a sponsor. For instance, my dad at one point was a sponsor and then I proceeded to watch him get drunk and give advice to his sponsee. So I did have some reservations about it. I'm not gonna lie there. Um, but what I have noticed, I've tried out various AA meetings and my favorite types of meetings, I switch off between two. Um, they're all women's meetings, that's what I prefer. But also, um, we read from the book in one format of the meeting I go to. So we are going through the steps and discussing it in a group format. And I do feel that that was really fruitful and helpful. Um, so between the self-reflection journals I did on my own and um, the step work in a group format informally, um, that's been sufficient for me. So you feel you've completed working the 12 steps? That's a difficult thing to answer because I feel that um, like many folks who have been in AA for many, many years, you can work the steps over and over for the rest of your life. So I never feel like I will be finished working the 12 steps because you could just start over and get a lot more clarity each time. Okay. But you haven't worked the steps with a particular person? Correct. One-on-one, -on -one, I have not. But you are still attending AA? Correct. Okay. And um, you're continuing in therapy on a once a month basis? Currently it's once a month. Okay. You've described a lot of stress that you've had around the process of being on probation, mm -hmm. nightmares. It almost sounds PTSD-ish. I'm not gonna try to diagnose you, but. No, I get it. <laughs> but, it but it sounds traumatic, let's put it that way. A little bit. Okay. What are you doing to manage that stress? I, um, exercise and nature are right up there at the top. Um, it's interesting because exercise has always been something I've enjoyed, um, even prior to all these. So some might wonder, well, what's changed? And I think it's um, the focus on health. So it's sort of um, hypocritical to say I'm healthy and then to binge drink, right? So. Um, I also became a certified yoga instructor. I did yoga for many years and love it, absolutely love it, hope to integrate it into my professional work. Um, so I do have a, a self-practice with yoga. Um, getting outside, I know it, it sounds, you know, a little, a little hokey, but getting outside, getting sunshine, getting enough sleep every single night if I can, and I'm the type that needs eight to nine hours. Um, just healthy eating, staying connected to people. Um, I did notice I've had periods of depression in the past and isolating was a big notable factor in that. Uh, so the combination of taking care of myself, taking care of my body, um, staying active, exercise is the most underutilized antidepressant in my opinion. So that's, that's genuinely helped. Um, also mindfulness as well. Um. You referenced the fact that you're doing yoga, and that's, I guess, part of your stress management. Yes. You were doing yoga pretty extensively at the time of your violation, or the, of, the, of the DUI, correct? I wouldn't say extensively. Weren't you just returning from a yoga retreat? I did, that was to become certified. Okay. So you were doing it enough to get certified? I mean, I... Yes, I suppose. I mean, I don't know what enough is. I, I don't know your definition of enough, but I was engaging in yoga. At the time of the DUI? Prior to the time of my DUI. Okay. I didn't think you were doing yoga while you drove your car. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, at one point you mentioned that your boss gave you um, a promotion to an associate. Mm -hmm. Was that because of the change in the licensing laws? We went from psychological assistant to psychological associate? That's a good question. Actually, no, that's purely coincidental. Um, I started on a part-time basis working for my boss um, prior to graduating. So I was working part-time and some of the duties were personal assistant duties. Uh, they weren't actually um, clinical. That's how it started. And so it evolved from there it became more substantial work, clinical work, and um, administrative work. And over time, it became, again, more substantial and more clinically oriented. 
And so after a set number of years, she felt it was appropriate to transition to an associate. You understand your boss can't change your registration category, right? Oh, correct. This is strictly- I noticed you signed documents as associate too, as opposed to psychological assistant too. I didn't realize that it, if it was within the framework of of a title of associate within her private practice. I didn't see fault in that, but I'm happy to change it if there is a problem with that. Okay. <clears throat> um, I noticed just out of curiosity that you gave a presentation at one point on gender deviance about women that chose not to have children. Oh yes, that was during undergraduate work. I was curious about the choice of the title. Um, I was merely um, helping in that process under uh, the guidance of a professor who chose that title. So I, I joined her research and her work after all of that had been implemented. It is an interesting title, though. It is Maybe we should put on the record what the title is since this is being audio recorded. Would you care to enlighten us? It's on page 389 of the package. Sorry, page 389. I believe so. That's what I put in my notes. Something we're not allowed I remember to say. The term, <laughs> I apologize. I remember the term voluntarily childless. Oh, no, it's not 389. Okay. Oh, excuse me. It's two, the 240s, I think. I'll find it. Okay. It may not be critical. I just thought if you could recall, you could clarify for the record, but it's in the document somewhere, so. Yeah, I just thought it was a curious title. Mm -hmm. Um Makes women sound like they are supposed to have kids. Uh, da, 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 yeah, I'm finding it. It's on page 254. It's a poster presentation evalu evaluations of gender deviance. Not the case of voluntarily childless women, but I don't want to belabor that point. Um, okay, I don't think I have any further questions. How often? Uh, just one more. How often are you going to AA? AA. Um, currently, I go once a week. Okay. And um, you have friends or, or, or people you feel close to in AA? In the sober community, uh, yes. Okay. And I noticed that just in terms of the letters that you provided, you didn't provide any from uh, any of the AA community? Uh, yes, I did have a recent switch in the groups I attend. Um, there was sort of an odd conflict uh, that happened in one of the meetings that was uncomfortable, so I did recently switch. And when I went, when I switched back to the meeting I had gone to for years um, in another city, a lot of the people that I would normally see there were not there. I did have their numbers. Um, however, again, because it's anonymous, I felt it was appropriate just to stick with uh, the people that I see beyond just those doors. Thank you. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. All right, uh, Member Riscate. Uh, thank you. I have no questions. Okay, Dr. Rogers. Hi, Dr. Davis. Thank you for being here. I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, Dr. Davis, is there anything that has come to mind that you would like to add based on the questions that you've been asked by uh, the board or by council? Mm -hmm. um, I think just in um, in speaking about the violations that were noted, um, I know I was asked about the um, positive tests, and I did clarify about that. I did want to speak further to the other ones that are listed here um, for April 14th, 2020, and for April 23rd, 2020, just to give a little bit of context. Um, at that time, you know, COVID shutdowns were March 20th. And during this time, you know, we kept hearing LA County, the worst week ever, and um, stay home and stay safe. And I asked uh, my probation manager at the time, what are the precautions in place? I have to go to urgent care to do these tests. So what are the precautions in place to ensure that I stay safe? He said to contact the local um, sites, which I did. And they basically said that um, they put less chairs in the waiting room, and that was their precaution. They didn't mandate any um, masks or any anything at all, really, um, just less chairs. And I felt r really unsafe in that matter. Um, I live with elderly parents, one of which is immunocompromised due to diabetes. and. Um, 
I really, I really felt firmly that I, my health could have been at risk at the time. So I asked if there was another way or what I could do. I was not trying to get out of testing. I wanted to be safe. I wanted to do it in a contactless manner, which they couldn't provide because they're observed tests. Um, the rollover to the oral swabs via video conference wasn't implemented un until later. So um, probation did acknowledge that a change needed to be made given the times of the pandemic, but it hadn't been uh, implemented yet. So um, yes, I did not test and yes, I violated. Um, it was due to the health concerns related to COVID and, and potentially exposing my parents. So, um, and the other violation for failing to check in on October 31st of 2020, I was visiting my sister in Northern California and it was my first time watching her two kids um, by myself. And um, as anyone that has kids knows, um, they're your alarm clock, not your actual alarm clock. So they woke me up at about 5.45 and I was nonstop all day um, babysitting them when, while my sister and her husband ran errands. Um, so I was just completely out of my element. I don't have kids of my own. Um, I don't usually watch kids. Um, it was great, but I was totally thrown off and completely forgot to check in. My habit is the second I wake up, I check in. That's what I do every time. So they kind of threw me for a loop and I only blame myself, but um, it was kind of unique circumstances. So that was the reasoning for uh, not checking in on that day. I realized the following morning um, immediately that I hadn't done it and contacted my probation manager to let him know. Um, so that that's the reasoning for that. Mm -hmm. That's all, thank you. Any additional questions, council? No. Any additional questions from any members of the board? Okay, so what appears now would be the time to hear any closing argument that you, that you would like to provide. You're not required to, but sometimes parties will take advantage of it. Attorneys tend to all the time, but you are free to make an argument at this point as to why your petition should be granted based on the facts you have provided. Mm -hmm. Would you like to do that now? Uh, yes. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate that um, I started sobriety for various reasons. I've continued sobriety for me, um, and I've only seen benefits from it. I know in my um, probation or my early termination application, um, I also discussed some of the reasons that helped get me to my sobriety date one of which was uh, the birth of my niece. Uh, my sobriety date is exactly three days after her birth. It really just illustrated to me that I wanted to be present in my family's lives. Um, and also, it sounds cliche, but I made a promise to my dad, literally on his deathbed, that I will learn from our mistakes. So um, while it may seem as though sobriety was forced upon me because of these terms, it was the universe aligning, showing me the way. And I chose to take that path. So it is really important to me to maintain sobriety. Um, I'm very open about it with my friends and anyone in my immediate circle, even in my bigger circle. Um, when people ask, I say it's for health. I had a problem and this is my way of um, making it right. I do intend to continue with both AA meetings and therapy moving forward, regardless of the outcome of today and regardless of the end date of probation. Um, it's been an uphill battle, but really important um, that I have been presented with these types of um, opportunities to either learn and grow from them or run from them. And um, I finally listened to the universe to grow from them. So um, as much as I talked about feeling the stress from other things and even from the terms of probation, it was sort of a necessary evil almost, um, um, you know, B.F. Skinner's learning theory of positive punishment, you um, instill a stimuli with the hopes of decreasing um, the undesired behavior 
and I feel this is it. it it's worked. So thank you. All right, thank you. Council, would you like to provide a recommendation? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. I would note that Dr. Davis has met the two-year requirement under Section 2962.4 that stipulates that for a period of probation, and this matter was four years, that she served the requisite two years before filing her petition for early termination. But mere compliance with probationary terms is not evidence of rehabilitation, and the record here isn't one of 100% perfect compliance. I know the board considers the underlying nature of the incidents that led to the stipulated settlement and decision, and that was a very serious DUI that fortunately, and I use that word not in jest, but only resulted in a motor vehicle accident and not in anyone's loss of life. And that was the second DUI that she had been involved with. The first one was nine years prior to that. I commend Dr. Davis on her sustained sobriety, and I wish her all the luck with that in the future as she acknowledged she is an alcoholic and there is no cure for that. And I am very glad to hear of the coping mechanisms and all of the other conditions of probation that she has complied with, that she has testified that have helped her deal with the fallout from that incident and also managing the underlying causes, the stresses that led to that and her coping mechanisms and changing them. But we would ask the board to deny the petition. And part of the reason for that request is that, as Dr. Davis testified, she brought up that probation causes her nightmares, daily or weekly anxieties. And despite all the coping mechanisms and the other things that she says she has learned to help deal with stress in her life, she has indicated that she feels probation is a major stress in her life and that it is because of probation that she cannot meet her career goals or some of her own goals for moving out of the house. The probation is a result that she entered into a stipulated decision from her actions. And I would submit it, probation isn't doing any of these things, that one of the signs of rehabilitation is accepting responsibility for your actions, learning from them. And I'm not trying to mischaracterize Dr. Davis's testimony. She has testified that she takes full responsibility for her abuse of alcohol and for what led to the accident and is serious about sustaining sobriety. But part of that in reading the evaluations, in reading her own words, the abuse of alcohol was one of the previous ways that she coped with stresses in her life. Probation in and of itself is it's, it's how you deal with it, how you choose to deal with it. And she has stated that it is this probation that she feels has placed these burdens and caused these stresses in her life. She voluntarily entered into this. It was not forced upon her. And those characterizations to me seem at odds with some of the other self-revelations she has journaled and chronicled about in terms of viewing her situation and reducing stressors in her life and changing, in her words, negatives into positives, looking to see what she can learn from something. And it was just those descriptions and characterizations of how she feels that probation is doing this and probation is leading to these stressors that I don't feel that she's completed her rehabilitation journey. Um, one of the ongoing conditions of her probation is that she continued to receive ongoing uh, group support, and whether that's through AA, and I know she's continued, she continued her counseling well beyond the required duration from the board, uh, and I hope, certainly hope she continues to do all of those things, and I wish her well, but we would be asking the board to deny the petition for those reasons. All right, thank you very much, counsel. And with that said, the matter is submitted and we are off the record. We will deliberate in closed session. It, Your Honor, just as a point of order, um, I know we discussed it before the hearing began, but I do have the, the board has received and you have as well the copy of the request for protective order sealing the confidential records and it was just exhibits six and eight in their entirety. Right, I have that and I'm prepared to grant that. Um, this is actually the first time I've had one in a board hearing. I'm not sure if they need to grant it or I do. I think it's up to me. Um, to you. And I've reviewed it and it's fine. I just, my issue was I didn't have the exhibits. Now that I do, 
I'll just confirm that it's sufficient confidential information in there to support the redaction, or I'm sorry, the protective order rather than redaction. Thank you, Your Honor. But I'm fine with it and consider it approved. Thank you. Thank you. Is the record closed for you? I'm sorry? Is the record closed? Your yes, room? it's okay. closed. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Davis, and thank you, Deputy Attorney General. We're going to take a 10 minute break and we'll reconvene at 3.05 for our next petition hearing. Thank you. And so, do you intend to deliberate sort of whenever we get started? All right, we're about to get started, everyone. All right, we are back on the record for the next item um, in our petition today. This is item number three. It is in the matter of the petition for early termination of probation of Letha Maria Grayson. Uh, this matter is being electronically recorded, so I am going to spell the uh, first name. It's L-E-T-H-A. Everything else, in my opinion, is spelled the traditional way. The Office of Administrative Hearings number for this matter is 2022. 100206. The case number for this matter is 6002022000825. May I take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General, please? Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Deputy Attorney General Aaron Lynn on behalf of the Attorney General's Office of the State of California. Good afternoon. And may I take the appearance of the petitioner, if you could state your name for the record? Okay, please move the microphone closer to you and make sure that it is turned on. There's a button towards the bottom. Should see a little green light. Good morning. My name is Letha Grayson. Good afternoon. And may I, um, well, a couple of things. You are self-represented today, correct? Yes, I am. Okay, so what I'm going to do is at some point, once we uh, finish taking roll, I'm going to give you a list of instructions or go through instructions that we provide to uh, self-represented litigants. But prior to that, I'm gonna ask that the members of the board uh, please identify themselves for the record. <laughs> Dr. Shell Gesuga, board member. Julie Nystrom, board member. And Dr. Stephen Phillips, board member. Dr. Leah Tate, board president. Siron Fu, board member. Dr. Shikanda Rogers, board member. Dr. Maricela Cervantes, board member. Dr. Mary Harb Sheets, board member. Ana Lescate, board member. Okay, thank you very much. It appears we have a quorum. Um, I will note that we were um, scheduled to have a court reporter here today, but there has been no court reporter made available. So as a substitute, we have, and this is something we commonly use, an electronic recording, um, audio recording of today's proceedings. If a transcript is ever requested, a transcript can be made using the audio recording as opposed to having a court reporter with us live here today. Um, are you willing to consent to the use of the electronic recording in substitution for a court reporter, Dr. Grayson? Yes, I am. All right, thank you very much. So with respect to self-represented litigants, I mentioned we go through some brief instructions to be sure you understand how this hearing will proceed and to give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. As I mentioned, I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, my role here is essentially completely independent. Um, I don't think the best way to say it, consider I'm with the board. But essentially my role here is independent and I'm here essentially to interpret what their conclusions were and produce those into essentially a proposed decision that they will ultimately adopt or reject. Understood? Understood. No, I sort of jumped around a bit there, but essentially they will make a decision. I will write the decision. They will adopt it and or reject it or modify it as needed. Understood? Understood. All right. In terms of how we will proceed today, um, I give each side the opportunity to make an opening statement. It's not something that you have to take advantage of, but it's your opportunity to essentially tell us what you intend to present in terms of evidence today. Understood? Understood. Okay. The Deputy Attorney General will provide us with background information on your case with respect to what, what led to the discipline against your license. Um, once that is done, you will have the opportunity to present evidence today. You can present that in the form of your own testimony. We already have your petition. If you have any witnesses to call, you can let us know at that time. Understood? Understood. Okay. Once you present your evidence, you will be asked questions by both the Deputy Attorney General and the Board. Um, 
And then at the conclusion of questioning, I will also give the, uh, the opportunity to make a closing argument. That's essentially your chance to say what you believe the board should do based on the evidence that you have presented. Understood? Understood. Okay. We will also take a recommendation from the Deputy Attorney General. Okay? Yes. All right. Because today's hearing is being electronically recorded, it's important that, you, um, or that we all follow some basic rules. We want to be sure we speak one at a time. It's extremely difficult to um, take down a clear recording of two people speaking at once. Although that commonly occurs in everyday conversation, we want to be careful not to do that here today. So be sure that you wait until the question is complete before you respond. We will all do our best to make sure you have finished your response before asking you the next question. Understood? Understood. One last thing we want to avoid are nods of the head, shakes of the head, and sounds like uh-huh and uh-uh, because those things are subject to multiple interpretations. So far this, uh, this afternoon, you've been great providing clear, loud, audible responses. So we just want to keep doing that. All right? Yes. Do you have any questions for me before we get started? No, I do not. All right. Then with that said, I'm ready to hear background information whenever you're ready, Mr. Lynn. Thank you, Your Honor. I am appearing today on behalf of the Attorney General of the State of California. I'm here to assist both Your Honor and this panel in this fact-finding hearing. My role is not adversarial, but is intended to protect the public interest and ensure that both Your Honor and this panel have adequate information in order to make an informed decision today. At this time, I'd like to go through the exhibits, identify them, and present any issues with their admission into evidence at this time, Your Honor. You may proceed. Thank you. Exhibit A contains jurisdictional documents. They are marked and tabbed A1 through 4 in the exhibit binder provided to Your Honor as well as petitioner. They are the certificate of licensure, the certified decision and order, certified statement of issues, and the notice of hearing. I would note for the record that the notice of hearing that is contained in exhibit A4, pages 47 through 48, is not accurate. There was a subsequent notice of hearing that was sent out by the board, both to the petitioner as well as to the Attorney General's office on November 2nd of 2022, indicating this time and this location. Exhibit B is the petition for penalty relief. It includes tabs B1 through B3, which is the petition for early termination of probation packet, educational certificates of completion, as well as miscellaneous documents that the petitioner submitted and provided. They are encompassed in pages 49 through 95. Exhibit C is the investigative probation report. It is the probation monitor Christian Lavaro's probation report, and it is from pages 96 through 98. Exhibit D is the certified probation file. I have divided that into 12 separate tabbed uh, exhibits, D1 through D12. They are the probation file and chronological record probation monitor and petitioner email communications, the pre-orientation packet, probation intake and acknowledgement of decision, quarterly reports of compliance, real estate license, postdoctoral residency hour logs, psychological evaluation, psychotherapy reports, continuing education and coursework, probation costs, and billing and practice monitoring reports. Exhibit D starts on page 99 and goes through page 336. Exhibit E are additional documents that the petitioner provided to the Attorney General's office after her petition was filed with the board. This is E1. They are letters of support and other miscellaneous documents that she did provide. They are encompassed on pages 337 through 357. In preparation of today's hearing, the, attorneys, the Attorney General's office did uh, draft, prepare, and we are asking for a protective order sealing confidential records in this matter. We did provide that to both the board and the petitioner prior to today's hearing. What we are asking is that the court sign the order to protect portions of Exhibit D. It would be D8 through D9, starting on page 229 through 281. These are extensive and intimate psychological evaluation and psychotherapy documents for which they are too voluminous to redact. And if redacted, the document would be unintelligible for hearing purposes, and we are making that request today. In regards to the balance of the documents, 
A majority of them, we have no opposition to being admitted into evidence today. However, the Attorney General's Office would lodge uh, objections to some documents, and I defer to the court if you want to hear arguments on that now or at a later time. So at a later time, are you proposing to do it when you make your recommendation, or at what point? I can do it at my recommendation. I can do it um, during my opening statement. It's however the court wants to hear this, because I know that uh, petitioner may wish to address any arguments that we're making in response. Right. Yeah, why don't you do it during your um, opening statement? Very well, Your Honor. Thank you. That encompasses all of the exhibits that I believe. Okay. So with respect to the request for a protective order, sealing confidential records, that request is granted, and I will issue a protective order to that effect. Thank you, Your Honor. With regard to the uh, notice of hearing that's contained in Exhibit A that you've explained has been updated, I'm satisfied with the uh, version of the notice of hearing that has been included with the exhibits for jurisdictional purposes, considering that uh, we have the petitioner sitting in front of us. Um, and I don't believe there will be an objection to the jurisdictional documents, but I'm going to check right now. Uh, so, Dr. Grayson, um, counsel has requested that Exhibit A be admitted for jurisdictional purposes. The uh, shorthand explanation is that he's asking that these documents be admitted to establish our jurisdiction to proceed today with this hearing, i.e. that you have filed a petition, requested a hearing, one has been scheduled, you've received a notice of hearing, and we're all here today to have that hearing. Do you have any objection to Exhibit A being admitted for that purpose? No objections, Your Honor. Okay. Exhibit A is admitted for jurisdictional purposes. And with respect to the rest of the exhibits, have you had the opportunity to review them? No, I have not. Okay, when did you receive them? This morning. This, just, this morning, uh, right now. Just like, a moment ago? Yeah. Okay, would you like the opportunity to, in fact, I'd feel more comfortable if you did. Why don't you take a look through them just to make sure you understand what they are, and I'm going to see if you have any objection to them oh. being admitted into evidence. Thank you. And while you're doing that, we can go off the record okay. rather than having us sit here and stare at you. So off the record briefly. And these have not been previously submitted, counsel, not even electronically? To the no, that is incorrect, Your Honor. We did provide discovery to petitioner in a digital format. Uh, we did ask her if she was able to download them in a hyperlink format. She was able to download and look at them prior to today's hearing date. Okay. Uh, and when was that? Stand by. I'll get to you both. When was that? We're off the record. We're just talking here. Uh, over a month ago. It was when we first notified the board of the discovery, when we sent the board the discovery. It was all digitally done. Okay. And you have no recollection of that, Dr. Grayson? I do have a recollection. I was just unable to open the link. I tried on many occasions to open the link. I, I think the one for the redaction purposes was the one that I was unable to open. Okay. I understand. Why don't we take a second and take a look at them now so we can move forward. What was the uh, redacted information that I... Where is that located? Can you Are you referring to the uh, protective order? Yes. If you have it off the top of your head, counsel. I have the protect, I, she has a copy of the protective order in front of her, and I did list uh, precisely what documents they would include and encompass, and again, that was submitted virtually and electronically to her uh, several weeks prior to today's date. Okay. And this morning, prior, or rather this afternoon, prior to us coming on the record, I did inform her that we'd be seeking uh, protective order for the psychotherapy and psychological evaluations. All right, so it looks like it's Exhibit D, page 29 through 281? That is correct. It's tabbed D8 and D9. Okay.
I'm finished with the review. All right, and have you reviewed all the documents, or at least you have the chance to look at them to oh, have no. some understanding as to what they are? So oh. We're going to be talking about, at least we're going to be asking whether you have an objection to all of them. Oh. And again, some of them you should have already seen for sure, the decision and order, things of that nature. Your certificate for licensure. Just maybe take a quick look at each tab to be sure you're familiar with what they are. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. But I I right. We reminded that. People say they have to have a good I would say so, yes. Okay. All right, so we are back on the record. And while we were off the record, Dr. Grayson reviewed essentially all of the exhibits, um, but also paid particular attention to, I believe, what is marked as Exhibit D8 and 9 with respect to the uh, request for the sealing order. Um, so I initially said I would grant it because the goal is to seal confidential information related to you. I've never received an objection from someone who, whose information is being protected, but I'll give you that opportunity if you have a question or concern with respect to that ruling. Are you fine with me sealing those documents? Yes, please seal it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So now with respect to the remainder of the documents, we talked about Exhibit A, so let's move on to Exhibit B. 
Do you have any objection to Exhibit B being admitted to evidence? It appears to be your petition with attachments. I have no objection. Okay, hearing no The Attorney General's office does have an objection to part of that, Your Honor. Okay, and I think this is what you're referring to earlier. Maybe I should let, let the two of you do it. So what's your objection? My objection is to uh, the miscellaneous aspect of that. It's B3, it's pages 92 to 95. Uh, our objection is both for relevance and hearsay purposes. We don't believe that it goes to uh, petitioner's rehabilitation and that it contains hearsay within hearsay information. B3, page 92 through 95? That is correct, Your Honor. All right, so give me one moment to review this. Hey, Dr. Grayson, why do we have this? Um, it was, um, these were actual, like, um, records of where I was supporting my son, um, just financially, he called and said he was going to commit suicide. And just to show of my support for him, so just sending him money just to make sure that he is okay, basically okay. able to pay for his phone. That was pretty I'm much referring it. specifically to page 92. 92. Oh, 92, I see. Um, you say 92 through 95, correct? Yes, correct. This, is, this is another one. Well, the basis of this the reason, one of the reasons why my license is on probation is because my son and I had this interaction um, in which I ended up calling the police because I felt threatened. That's the basis of this case. And so uh, in many of the documents that I've submitted, they were just showing that he has this continuing behavior. Just this is this is this was something that was mailed to me as they were looking for my son at a previous address. That's Got it. pretty much, and it relates to an action that was filed against your son. Uh, uh, exactly. Yes. Okay. Um, so, based on what I've heard thus far, I don't see how this is relevant. You are free to talk about what occurred. I'm always a little bit concerned with taking um, documents or criminal records relating to some action that someone did who isn't here to explain what happened or defend right. themselves, and the fact that something. I believe, based on what I'm reading here, was filed against someone doesn't allow me or the board to conclude anything that happened other than something may have been filed. Doesn't mean those that um, there were no criminal charges ever formally filed or that they weren't dismissed, or that there may have been some um, hearing or trial that was dispositive and totally uh, released him from any responsibility or liability um, with respect to those charges. So I'm going I do understand, um, but the and, go ahead. And more importantly, I'm not sure it's it's. I'm not sure it's of much assistance with respect to what we're here to do today. Okay. You are free to to testify to any extenuating circumstances that existed at the time when your license was disciplined, but I don't think we need this level of detail, particularly with respect to an individual who's not here to essentially defend themselves. Okay. Yes. And so later on, I did present a letter where he okay. did and document. Yes. We he, will get to that. Just okay. at this point, Excellent. I just want to rule okay. on this particular portion of the motion. So that's 92. What about 93 through 95? They were just letters of, they were, it was just um, information where I'm supporting him currently. Uh, just kind of going to the idea that the relationship is being um, nourished, uh, so to speak. Okay, and again, I'm not sure the documents necessarily establish that. It, mm -hmm. appears, it appears to be copies of text messages with thumbs up and or thumbs up emojis, I believe would be the term, and dollar amounts. Um, but I will allow you to testify to that. Okay, thank you. Um, but with respect to the documents, I'm not sure they're relevant either, or I'm going to sustain the objection. So with respect to Exhibit B, pages 92 through 95 are not admitted. Any other concerns with respect to Exhibit B, Council? No, Your Honor. Okay. And let's move to Exhibit C. Um, any objections or concerns with respect to Exhibit C being admitted from either side? No, Your Honor. And Dr. Grayson, you're fine with Exhibit C? Yes. Okay, Exhibit C is admitted. Let's move on to Exhibit D. Any uh, concerns from either party or either side? No, Your Honor. 
Dr. Grayson, you're fine with Exhibit D being admitted? Um, there is a portion of Exhibit D um, in the back where it says that there was a warning issued. Um, what page? Uh, it is uh, 101 AGO. Okay, I see there's a handwritten note. Go ahead. Um, and uh, on this particular note, um, I would I would like to have this this not admitted. Um, my company was having a security issue, and the emails I sent out at that particular time were not sent. Um, and so this warning that I received was I I, I sent information substantiating. Um, that there was a security issue um, with my company server because that's where I sent the email. It was a report. It was um, it was a probation report um, that I sent, and um, because there was a security issue, there was there was no you know the the information was sent. So I, I I just think that this shouldn't be admitted because I shouldn't have gotten this warning. There was a there was an electronic issue with my com with my uh, okay. companies. I believe I understand your concern. So here's one um, explanation that I will provide, um, and I do it often with self-represented <laughs> litigants. I didn't this morning because I didn't know we were going to go into this level of detail on uh, admitting exhibits. So the fact that a document is admitted to evidence does not mean that either myself or the board will assume that everything in the document is true, okay. nor will we assume that it's not true. By the document being admitted, it simply means we can review the document and consider it along with all the other evidence, meaning all the other documents, and any testimony that you provide. Okay. So generally to the extent a party disagrees with something that's written in a document or doesn't feel what's written in the document is warranted, that is not a basis to exclude it from evidence. Okay. But what you're allowed to do when you testify is explain the circumstances and then everyone that's reviewing it can decide how much weight to give that particular note. Whether we give it 100% weight or sometimes 0% weight or something else. Okay. So your objection's overruled, but I do want you to understand that the fact that a document is admitted does not mean it's going to be assumed to be 100% true. Okay. And you have the opportunity to contest it when you testify. Understand? Yes. All right. Any other objection to Exhibit D? No. Exhibit D is admitted. All right. Exhibit E. Any objections to Exhibit E from either side? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Go ahead, Counsel. The Attorney General's Office doesn't have any objection to the first two pages in Exhibit E. They're pages 337 and 338. They appear to be letters uh, of support and recommendation. We have no objection to those. The balance of Exhibit E, we do have objections to, and I can address them one at a time if, you're, if Your Honor is so willing to hear me. Okay, so I'm looking for Bates numbers for the first two, and the very first one is so small I can't read it, but I think it's 337. So no objection to pages 337 and 338? That's correct, Your Honor. And they're the first two pages, uh, and they appear to be letters of support and recommendation. We have no objection to those. But you object to 339 through? 340, uh, 357. Is that the last page? Yeah. Uh, yes, sorry. I apologize, Your Honor. That's fine. And what's the basis for your objection to the balance of Exhibit E? Our objections are the following four pages, 339, through 343, we object as to both relevance and hearsay. I'm sorry, was that 43 or 40? 43. Thank you, okay. Um, they appear to be emails from the petitioner regarding attachments of 2020 restraining orders pertaining to a third party, uh, petitioner's certificate of live birth, which contains uh, quite a number of sensitive information about the petitioner that I don't believe is relevant. Okay, let's address those that objection first. I mean, you have any other objections to those pages? Uh, relevance and hearsay. And then the last one is the Navy discharge paperwork pertaining to a third party, again, having multiple uh, indications of sensitive information that don't appear relevant. What page is the Navy discharge paperwork on? Forty-three, three hundred forty-three, Your Honor. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the protective order. I apologize. Right. Uh, the Navy questionnaire. It's three forty-five. Sorry, okay. I was getting ahead of myself. Okay, so let's deal with uh, three thirty-nine to three forty-three. Dr. Grayson, can you tell us why you believe this information is necessary or helpful in terms this, of uh, determining your petition? Well, 
the petition, uh, as it's based, um, was about um, child endangerment. And um, the individual, the individual, my son, um, and the incident is, I mean, it, it just, I explained earlier that when they, when I call the police, that um, I was threatened when the police got there. And so I had to make a decision. Um, and my decision was that my son not be taken and thrown into jail. Um, okay. But that, that behavior, I know that's, that's like, right. that's, stand by, stand that's by. fine, but. Stand by, stand by. And I don't mean to cut you off, but it sounds like it's the same basis for the documents yes, that we talked is. about earlier. Yes, it is. Okay. Then I'm going to make the same ruling. Again, you'll be able to testify, but I'm not going to admit these documents into evidence. So that covers 339 through 343. You may continue, counsel. Uh, pages 344 to 356, the same objections, both as to relevance and hearsay. They seem to encompass security documentation establishing a third party, um, as well as national security questionnaire that a third party filled out that contains sensitive information that, again, doesn't appear to be relevant to the petition. And that's 344, did you say to 356? That is correct, Your Honor. 356. Okay. And were these submitted on the same basis as the other documents, uh, Dr. Grayson? No, the Navy discharge was submitted um, just to confirm um, his, uh, his godmother, because I have, um, I have letters from her, um, which are the first part of the exhibit, uh, but just to... Which page are you on? Uh, oh. You said the Navy discharge. I think we've covered that one already. Oh, do, oh that, okay. So three, that was... Three, to, 44 through 356. 344 to 356. Looks like it starts with an email you sent to Mr. Lent on just, October 6th. Oh, it's out of order. But this email was saying establishing Keila Byers as his godmother. That was what that information was for. Okay. 344. Through as whose godmother? Your son's? My son's godmother, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure we need that. Any, okay. any other basis for these documents? No. Okay. Then the same ruling. Objection sustained. Pages 344 through 356 will not be admitted. And I believe that leaves us with one page. Yes, Your Honor. And that's the last page. It's 357. Uh, again, same objections. Relevance, hearsay. It appears to be a Los Angeles Police Department release from custody of a third party unrelated to the petition. All right. um, anything additional to provide as to why uh, we would need 357 that you have not already provided, Dr. Grayson? Um, no. Um, uh, the basis, I guess, would be the same then. So I guess you would sustain your your uh, ruling. All right, same ruling. And again, our interest is in your, um, in essentially facts that support that your petition should be granted. It seems to me, looking at some of this, a lot of this is about your son, the type, either the type of person he was, the support he had or did not have. From where I sit, that's not necessarily relevant to the degree that we need these types of documents. And again, he's okay. not here to for lack of a better term, defend himself or provide any clarification. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to admit them. That doesn't <clears throat> preclude you, though, from testifying again to the circumstances um, as you see fit, as long as they support your petition. Understood? Yes. All right. So 357 is not admitted. And these bait stamps are written so small, it's very difficult to see. But I believe the first two pages, again, are 337 and 338. So Exhibit E, pages 337 and 338 are admitted. The rest of the documents are not admitted. All right, so I believe we've addressed the uh, exhibits. At this point, counsel, you may provide uh, background information. Proceed Thank you, Your Honor. Ready. Thank you. Dr. Grayson has petitioned for penalty reduction, seeking an early termination of her probation in this matter. The petitioner is currently serving a five-year-long probation period that became effective June 26 of 2020. This was following a statement of issues that was filed on May 24, 2019 for board case 600-2019-1-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0
179. Petitioner's probation status is currently active with a projected completion date of June 26, 2025, which is just over two years and seven months from today's date. On or about August 23rd of 2018, the California Board of Psychology received an application for registration as a psychological assistant from the petitioner. The board at that time denied the application on December 21st, 2018, and a statement of issues was subsequently filed on May 24th, 2019, based on petitioner deny, uh, appealing the denial of the licensure. The statement of issues charged four causes for denial of petitioner's application. The first two bases were two separate convictions of substantially related crimes. The third, commission of dishonest, fraudulent, or corrupt acts. And the fourth was committing acts constituting grounds for discipline of a licensee. licensee. These charges stemmed from two separate instances in which the petitioner was caught by law enforcement and subsequently convicted of the following crimes. Misdemeanor child cruelty in violation of California Penal Code Section 273, Subdivision A, in December of 2002, in which petitioner struck her 14-year-old son with a belt. As stated in the certified decision after rejection, which is Exhibit A2, pages 4, paragraph 6. Quote, petitioner testified at the hearing that she just swung the belt at her son two or three times and it got wrapped around his ankle. She stated she just wanted to scare him and that he had pushed her into a dresser and had threatened to burn down the house. She called the police and they arrested her because she had no marks on her. She told the board during its investigation, however, that she had hit him three to five times and that he had held on to the dresser, end quote. Petitioner was subsequently sentenced to serve two days in county jail and placed on probation for three years with terms and conditions. In April of 2009, Petitioner was convicted of two separate counts of felony grand theft in violation of California Penal Code Section 487, Subdivision A. In the first instance, Petitioner falsely advertised a home for rent, received payment from a victim to the rent of the home under a corporation in which the Petitioner was the sole officer and director, which was actually owned by the bank, and then subsequently refused to refund the renter's deposit. In the second instance, Petitioner falsely advertised a home for rent, received payment from a victim to rent the home that was actually in foreclosure and owned by the third party, again, under a corporation which Petitioner was the sole officer and director, and then refused to refund the renter's first month's rent. As stated again in the certified decision after rejection, which is Exhibit A2, page 5, paragraphs 9 through 10, at the hearing, Petitioner denied falsely advertising the two properties testified that she was actually the victim and blamed an associate who claimed, uh, who, who she claimed came from a family of police officers and that petitioner implied a connection with the raid on her house that was not described in her previous application. Consequently, the petitioner was sentenced to three years of probation, was ordered to serve two days of county jail, complete 60 days of Caltrans and several other terms and conditions of probation. The statement of issues proceeded to a hearing, which was conducted on November 26, 2019, and concluded with a proposed decision on December 19, 2019. On or about May 27, 2020, the board issued an order adopting the decision, which became effective on June 26, 2020. Pursuant to that decision, petitioner's psychological assistant registration application was granted upon successful completion of all registration requirements within two years, and subsequent thereupon, her registration was revoked and stayed for a period of five years of probation. She was ordered to undergo psychological evaluation and testing, submit to the supervision of a billing monitor of at least one hour per week, undergo weekly psychotherapy of one hour per week over a period of 52 weeks, yearly fiscal responsibility, ethics, multiple relationship boundaries, and child abuse coursework, quarterly reports, and probation costs. As previously stated, the effective date of the board's decision and order was June 26 of 2020. Completion of the five-year probationary period will occur on June 6, 26, 2025. On July 8 of 2022, two years from the date that the board's decision and order, petitioner filed her petition for early termination of probation, having been only on active probation for two years and 13 days. In terms of where petitioner stands with her current probation as of September 22, 2022, 
according to the probation monitor report, which is exhibit C1, pages 96 through 98, all conditions of probation have been met and are ongoing. I believe that accurately summarizes the matter as of today's hearing. As this is a petition for early termination, again, it is the petitioner's burden to demonstrate that she is rehabilitated and that probation should be terminated or modified by clear and convincing evidence. Therefore, I have nothing further to add at this time, but I do reserve the right to cross-examine the petitioner or call her as a witness if she chooses not to before making my recommendation to this board. Thank you. Thank you very much, counsel. So Dr. Grayson, do you intend to call any witnesses to testify other than yourself? Um, I do have a witness that I would like to call, yes. And is that witness here now? Yes. And are you prepared to call them now? Yes. All right. Um, We'll have to figure out what we're going to use as a witness stand here. Okay, that works for me. As long as those microphones work. So, do we need to do anything to make arrangements or are we all set? Stand by, Miss. You're fine here. Okay. And who are you calling as a witness? This is my wife. Her name's Emma Barron. Can you say her last name once more, please? Barron, B A R R E N. Thank you very much. Ms. Barron, you prepared to testify today? Yes, I am. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you provide today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Please lower your hand. Would you please now state and spell both your first and last name for the record? Emma E M M A Barron. B A R R E N. Thank you very much. Have you testified in a uh, proceeding of this nature before? Yes. Okay. Are you familiar essentially with the rules? Normally people say no. So if you are familiar with how this works, I won't go into any detail. But I will say that um, this is a petition that was filed at Dr. Grayson's request. The information, the evidence, the facts we are interested in are those facts that support. Her position that she no longer requires supervision in order for the public to be protected. Sometimes with cases like this, we'll sort of get into the weeds with respect to the background. There's been a lot of information I've already um, excluded from the documents related to her son, whether he was arrested or certain things happened. I want you to understand what the board is interested in is her rehabilitation and her fitness to practice without restriction. Understood? Yes. Okay, you may begin with your questions, Dr. Grayson. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first question I have for you um, is, um, have you witnessed me um, getting ready for work? Yes. And in that getting ready, um, has there been clear focus? Yes. Okay. So um, in the course of a day, what time would you say from morning leaving work to getting home how many hours would you say I worked in a day if if all of those hours were included in work from leaving to getting home um 14 15 hours and when I'm home um would you say there's also complete focus yes perfect thank you That's, no more questions no more questions all right. Uh, Mr. Lent, do you have any questions for this witness? Uh, just one question. Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Barron, why is it that we don't see a copy of a recommendation letter from you in here? Were you asked to provide one? No. No further questions. All right. Would the uh, board like to ask Ms. Barron any questions? I'm seeing shakes of the head. If anyone does, speak up now. You certain? Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate it. You are excused. Thank you. Any additional witnesses, Dr. Grayson? That's it. Okay. Are you prepared to testify yourself? I am. Would you like to do that now? Yes. Um, Stand by. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you provide today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You may lower your hand. And again, I've already explained, at least to your witness, what we're interested in is your rehabilitation, 
facts to support your petition to establish that you should be able to practice without restriction. Go ahead. Well, um, I, I work at a hospital. It's psychiatric um, care with people who are suicidal for the most part. Um, but they have dual diagnosis, alcoholics, drug addicts, schizophrenia, bipolar mania, and I work with these individuals um, as a therapist individually as well as group therapy. So I may be in a room with about 30 individuals, um, each having different presentations, um, DTS, DTO, gravely disabled, um, and I'm quite comfortable with them. Um, and I think that comfort comes from knowing that they will be in a better place once they leave. Um, the hospital. It is a, a collaborative uh, team setting, um, but the piece that I play, the role that I play, um, is immense. Um, we do have different types of therapy, one being milieu therapy, um, which is the disciplinary therapy. So when they leave the room, they're no longer being cared for by a therapist. Um, they're in the hands of the nurses, um, staff persons, other staff persons, maybe unlicensed um, persons, but um, they are in a better place. Um, we actually have what they call codes. Well, they um, will call a group of nurses or staff persons to somewhat subdue a patient if that patient has become unruly um, on various occasions. I've had those patients run Dr. to- Dr. Yes. Do you need a couple of minutes? No, I'm break? fine. No, sure? I'm fine, yes. I've had those patients run into my group room to seek safety, knock on the windows to try to get in. And um, gently I'd open that door and let them in from the outside. Um, and those persons sometimes would stand by to wait for them to leave the room after they've sought that safety. Um, and it's in those moments that I realize that I'm here to do a job, and I do that very well. One of the things about my job um, is that I get to work with different populations. I get to work with people in EDO, people who, um, as I said earlier, are drug addicts or don't have a place to live or a place to go, um, uh, or children uh, who have the same situations. And this, this micro community that we have um, is very reflective of what I see for individuals in the outside world. And I think that my place in this community um, will be reflected once I am no longer on supervised um, uh, work status, if you will. Um, so I, I look forward to that. I look forward to um, being able to help in any way that I choose to help, knowing that I can be that, that safe harbor um, for those individuals. Um, I have gone through um, a lot of training and certifications and seminars and all of those things, but none of those things actually um, have given me the pleasure that I get um, when working with with people, with individuals in a community such as mine. Um, so I will probably maintain my job at my hospital, which I um, began with as an intern, and um, was so afraid of these people, so afraid um, that these people wanted to harm or hurt 
but to see that that's not the case. They actually want to be protected. They actually want to be seen. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the condition right now of what's happening in the world. Um, a lot of people can't be seen or are unseen and invisible, but I think I can help that. And that's all I want to offer today as far as my testimony. Thank you. Okay, and if I could just jump in, can you make a connection for us or explain how that ties to your petition? If your petition is granted, how will it affect those things that you're talking about? And then I'll allow questions. Generally, I just, I'm not a practitioner, so I want to be sure at least I have some foundational information from you. Absolutely. Um, so my petition um, and those things that I talked about uh, connect in a way um, whereby I, I right now, I am doing the work and I love the work. But there are some things that are happening right now. For instance, um, I work about 100, I, I work 80 miles from my current position. And um, because the supervisor that I work with right now is, is um, 80 miles away, so 160 miles both ways, I cannot work at a hospital close to my home. We have a facility but I cannot work there because she's not a supervisor there. So um, I can't get a job with my license on probation. So, so I make the drive, I do the work, but that's how it, it, it kind of ties it in because I cannot go anywhere because no one will hire me. I've tried, I've, I've made those, you know, I've, I've asked you know, other psychologists if they would supervise me, but they won't. Um, so that's the tie-in, that's the tie-in. So I think my work would be more enjoyable if I could get up and maybe make a normal commute. When I say normal, I mean the average commute is about 30 minutes. Mine can be three hours in a day, one way. Um, but the average is about two hours, one way. So I think that I would be able to do <laughs> more of that work that I love. Um, if I am able to have my, my license off probation, because I can work somewhere else. Not even being off probation, but just being able to be hireable um, right now, because I'm not, not I, I, live, I live in a, I live too far away. Um, so I live in a suburb of Los Angeles, about 70 miles from where I currently, um, about 70 miles from Los Angeles, 80 miles from my house one way. So um, I make that commute. But I enjoy my patients and I enjoy my job. But that is how it would connect. I would be able to work and maybe be, <laughs> even do better work because I'm not up three and a half hours, four hours to get on the freeway to get to work. So those 14 hours that Emma mentioned, it doesn't have anything to do with work. It has to do with the drive and the commute. Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Why don't we take a short break before I allow questions? I know we're sort of tight on time, but it seems to me a short break might be appropriate. So let's take five minutes, go off the record, and we'll come right back. We are back on the record. And Mr. Lint, you may begin with your questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Grayson, I want to start and probably do most of our discussion, our cross-examination today, talking specifically about the petition you filed. And I have a couple questions in regards to clarifying some of the things that are in there. So if I can direct your attention, it's Exhibit B1 is your petition. And I want to start on page 51. Uh, so it's under Section 8, titled Petition Format and Attachments. And please let me know when you're there. Page 51, under Exhibit B1. Okay. 
B1, B as in boy. B as in boy. I My apologies. All right, B as in boy. Okay. All right. Um. Okay, I'm here. Under section eight, titled petition format and attachments, uh, subsection A, it says in a detailed narrative statement, address this question, why do you feel your petition should be granted? You see that? Yes. And the following pages, which are pages 52 to 54, you provided a written statement, is that correct? Yes. And that's a written statement addressing that question? Yes, I believe so. Uh, in reviewing that uh, written statement, I noted that I didn't see any specific discussion of your prior convictions. Is there a reason why you didn't specifically address those? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you ask me that again? Sure. In your written statement addressing the specific question is why you feel your petition should be granted, the two and a half pages that you wrote, which are from pages 52, 53, and 54, you don't specifically talk about the convictions that I addressed earlier that led to your uh, statement of issues and subsequent probationary status. Is there a reason why you didn't specifically detail or address those convictions? I may have misunderstood what that question was asking. I did provide a lot of information that's been thrown out as of right now. So I was not ever not trying to address those convictions. Okay. Going to the next attachment in your petition, that was identified as attachment A. If I could address your attention to attachment B, which is located on page 55, following that statement. Attachment B is titled Petition for Early Termination and or Modification of Probation Disciplinary Action Information Sheet. Do you see that? It's page 55? Yes. The first question there asks you to describe the events that led to your discipline. And in relation to the child cruelty conviction, you had indicated in addressing that, quote, the first event was when I attempted to discipline my son with a belt. The belt left a mark. I had no intention of hurting him, end quote. Is that accurate? That is what's written here, yes. And you wrote that? Yes. When. I was reviewing the certified documents in here and the hearing, which is specifically Exhibit 2, page 4, paragraph 6, when it talked about your testimony at the hearing. You had testified, according to the ALJ in that exhibit, that you, quote, just wanted to scare your son. Is there a reason why, in your petition today, it's the first time you're discussing corporal punishment or discipline as a motivation for that incident? Say it. And just to be clear, you said Exhibit 2. I believe you're referring to Exhibit A? A2. A2. Correct. Uh, page 4, paragraph 6 is where that quote is from. Yes. Can, you, okay. Can you ask that question again, please? I will restate it uh, to the best of my abilities. Your answer to question 1 on page 55 in describing the child cruelty conviction was that you had indicated and stated in here that it was to discipline your son. But in the certified records that are contained in Exhibit A, specifically A2, page mm -hmm. 4, mm -hmm. paragraph 6, mm -hmm. when your statement of issues hearing was conducted, mm -hmm. you had stated, according to the ALJ in that certified document, that the basis of the incident was not discipline or corporal punishment, but rather you, quote, wanted to scare him. My question is, why is it you are now alleging that the basis of the conduct that you exhibited for the child cruelty conviction was corporal punishment or discipline now when that wasn't something that you had previously indicated? I just wanted him to stop. That's all. And however you want to make that sound, discipline or what the other word you used, uh, corporal punishment, I just wanted him to stop. and. Um, I know I K 
cannot perjure myself, but I have mentioned in your certified documents that I was threatened by police. Um, um, and so, yes, there may have been some inconsistencies in my statement, um, but again, I call the police. The second portion of question one on page 55, you talk about a second event that occurred in which you state, quote, I rented properties and an employee moved into one of the properties and accused me of wrongdoing. First of all, based on that narrative, it appears you're only addressing one of the two grand theft convictions. Um, and am I correct in your implication that that is your belief that a third party committed the wrongdoing rather than yourself in that particular instance? Is that I was a fully licensed agent at that time. Let me restate the question. Based on the statement that you put in here, it seems as though you are implying that a third party was the one responsible for the conduct. Is that accurate or inaccurate? Is, is what, can you repeat that question again? What is it, uh, uh, am I trying, say that? Can you, can you say that again, please? I'll ask it in a different way. When you wrote your answer in that question and you said, quote, I rented properties to an employee who moved into one of the properties and accused me of wrongdoing, what did you mean by that? I have since retained or been granted my license from the real estate board. The um, pleading procedure uh, for which I pled no contest um, was um, something that I did um, based on what I was told was wrongdoing. Um, and that, that is where the wrongdoing took, took place. I mean, I was told afterwards, as in getting my license back, that I was a fully licensed agent um, at that time. Um, so the, the trespass and those other things that took place um, could have been taken care of in a different way. I, however, I didn't know. I didn't have representation at that time. And I'm sorry, Dr. Grayson, can you explain to us though what you meant when you wrote that sentence is what I think he's getting at. The sentence? I'll tell you what the sentence okay. is. It's the second sentence on section one of that page. It says, a second event occurred when I rented properties and an employee moved into one of the properties and accused me of wrongdoing. So how would you explain what that means to someone that's not familiar with your case? Um. I was a real estate agent in that case. I was the one who um, had the properties um, on contract, on assignment from people who were losing their properties. This was a, it was a, um, it was a time when properties were being um, rented, um, were being lost. People were walking away from their properties. My employee um, decided he was gonna move into the property. Uh, he had keys. I had the contracts, but he had the keys. He called me when I was in Las Vegas and told me I'm moving into the property. The business plan for that, um, for my business at that time, was to purchase, was to go to owners who were losing their properties, give them money, let them know that we were going to rent the properties. I had an employee working for me who called me when I was in Vegas and said he was going to move into the property. I understand. So that's why I said he blamed me of wrongdoing. So he moved into the property, and so since he moved into the property, I, because I was a licensed real estate agent at that time, was the person who was accused of the wrongdoing. So that's, that's what I'm saying. I was a licensed real estate agent at that time, so he was my employee, so I was responsible. Got it. Yes. Thank you, that's helpful. Next question, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to jump to question five on that same page. It's page 55. Question five asks, did you provide restitution of any kind in the case? 
Yes. Your response was, yes, I accept responsibility. I should have acted to stop the employee. Instead, I ignored his threats. Again, looking over the certified documents that are contained in these exhibits, this is the first time I could come across an instance where you alleged that an employee or anyone threatened you. First, can you explain why this is the first time we're hearing about it? And second, can you elaborate what you mean by that? Poor boundaries. Um, I just had poor boundaries. I just, I just let people say stuff to me, threaten me, whatever it is they wanted to do, and I never said anything about it. Um, but he uh, came after me um, on social media. Uh, he had make he had a he had a phone of mine as an employee. He had a cell phone. He would call me and make threats to me. Um, Tell me, he, you know, he told me, um, he told me, I know you're, I, I can't prove anything right now, but I know you're doing something wrong. Um, and, the, and I agree that the business plan was novel, and that's how I got my license back from the board of, from the Department of Real Estate. I was able to produce that business plan. Um, it was stored on, in one of my, um, in one of my old emails, and so I was able to produce that, that there was an actual business plan. Um, but yeah, he threatened me, he did all these things. Um, the meetings that I had to recruit, to recruit these persons to come and work for me um, was at my house, at my home. Um, and this person knew where I lived. He knew, uh, he had my company cell phone. He, you know, he openly said, you know, you know I, I can't prove that you're doing something, but you know, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna out me in so, so many ways or whatever it was. But he was the one who was doing the bad. And I, I did. I had poor boundaries. You know, I would just stick my head in the sand if people would come after me or say something to me or, you know, um, I just had poor boundaries. Directing your attention to question eight on the same page, what assurances can you give or provide the board that you will not reoffend. In looking at your answer to that question, it seems as though uh, you direct your response specifically to the child cruelty convictions, not the basis of the grand theft. I is there a reason why you chose not to address those aspects of your discipline in this matter? I believe that's the same question. I, I thought that I could address that in a different way by producing all of the other documents that were not admitted to this hearing. And I, 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 I must have misunderstood what I was supposed to be doing. But I can say that I have better boundaries now um, due to my therapy and uh, speaking up for myself. Um, but um, this, this, this petition was written after years, a year of therapy and a lot of um, self, just self-awareness about a lot of the things that I wasn't doing. Um, to answer your question, um, again, I, I, I think I may have thought that I could kind of attend to that situation with other types of, in another area, maybe. Um, I wasn't quite sure. Um, but I, I, I never intended to neglect talking about what happened with my son or with the grand theft or anything like that. Um, as a matter of fact, um, my, my, I submitted you know, uh, the information. It's one of the exhibits in here uh, that my license had been granted based on you know, the, 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 um, the business plan that I was able to produce to the, to the Department of Real Estate. Um, and there was never any intent to uh, to to not answer these questions. As a matter of fact, that was all my only intent, which I'm being told is not the basis for this hearing. So my apologies. It was a mistake on my behalf. Moving along, I'd like to direct your attention to page 57. It's evidence of rehabilitation information sheet. It's uh, attachment C of your petition. Please let me know when you're there. Yes, here. This one in specifically in regards to um, therapy, is that correct? Yeah, uh, yes, I believe so. Okay. Uh, question two, have you sought therapy regarding the conduct that led to your discipline? You indicated yes, correct? Yes. And that was required as a term of your probation, correct? Yes. 
And as part of that requirement, you were required to attend a minimum of one hour per week for at least 52 consecutive weeks. Is that correct? Yes. At this time, I would direct yourself and the courts and panel's attention to Exhibit D9. It's pages 257 to 281, and those are the quarterly reports from your uh, therapy sessions. Okay. Please let me know when you're there. Which page? 57? It's tab D9. Mm -hmm. Just... So yeah. all, of, all of D9? Yeah. I'm going to go through it one at a time, and I'll direct everyone's attention to specific right. pages, if I may. So there are four quarterly reports. Some were poor copy quality, but they were included because that's the entirety of the probation record. Others were clearer copied, but there are four quarterly report pages in there titled first quarterly report, second quarterly report, third quarterly report, and then there is a final uh, report in there. Is that accurate? It appears to be so. Looking at the reports, each one uh, from your therapist starts the same paragraph essentially by identifying you by your name, your date of birth, and indicating the number of sessions that were done in that quarter and the dates. Does that seem to be a fairly accurate summarization of those four quarterly reports? Well, yes, yes, fairly so. Directing your attention to page 262, which is the first quarterly report. It indicates that you attended nine therapy sessions between January 14th and what appears to be March 22nd. Does that appear accurate? I didn't bring those records with me, um, but it's written here. From your recollection, did you attend therapy during that time span? Um, I believe so, yes. Per your um, requirement of probation, it required 52 consecutive weeks of therapy. And according to this, it appears that there are two gaps. Uh, in between January 14th and January 26th, that is more than a seven-day period. And in between February 2nd and February 18th, again, more than a seven-day period. Is there a reason why you did not have therapy on those consecutive weeks? The first, um, the first one was because of her scheduling conflict, but I did have uh, email uh, therapy with her. I did email to her, and she answered any concerns or any questions that I had for that particular one. Um, the second one, I do remember she said that she was uh, going on vacation or had some type of vacation, and again, I did email her uh, so that we could continue uh, our communication during that time. During this first quarter, uh, looking at the quarterly report, I do not see an indication of how long the therapy sessions were lasting. And per your probation terms, it was supposed to be a minimum of one hour per week. Can you recall whether or not each of those sessions were a minimum of one hour? They were one hour plus. Um, we would go over quite often. Turning your attention to page 265, same exhibit, titled Second Quarterly Report. Please let me know when you're there. Are you on that page? Yes. The first paragraph, again, indicates that the report is for yourself. It gives your name and date of birth. And then it states that there were 12 sessions in the quarter and then it just gives a date range of April 1st through June 30th, but does not identify specific dates that therapy took place. Is that accurate? I do see that, yes. To the best of your recollection, do you know whether or not there were 12 therapy sessions in between those two time periods? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. I can check my records, but I'm not sure. Okay. I do know that we had to double back um, some sessions. Um, uh, some sessions may have ended on a Wednesday, and then I had to go in and see her the same week on Friday. Um, 
because we had to have those sessions in and she, her scheduling was, was she was booked and trying to get me in, I would call in, um, you know, Emma would call in so that we wouldn't have the gaps. But yes, I did double back in the week, sometimes with just a, with just a one day, um, with just a one day break um, because she didn't have the scheduling available and so we'd have to double back and so like I said, I'd have you know, therapy on one and it would end and then it would just be one day in between and then I'd have to do another session just to try and stay, uh, um, adhere to uh, my probationary requirements. In this quarterly report, just as in the first quarterly report, there doesn't seem to be an indication of the minimum one hour uh, per session mandatory requirement as a term of probation. Again, to the best of your recollection, for those times that you went to therapy in this quarter, were those therapy sessions at least one hour? Yes, they were, if not more. If you could turn to the next page, which is 266, it's titled Third Quarterly Report. Looking at the third quarterly report, this report fails to state the number of therapy sessions, how many of them, when they took place, or the length of those sessions. To the best of your recollection, for the time period that the third quarter took place, could you give us an idea of how many therapy sessions took place and whether or not those were at least one hour apiece and in consecutive weeks? Depending on when the quarter started, um, there would be 12 to 15 sessions, depending on her schedule. Um, because like I said, I would have to double back um, just to adhere to the requirement. Um, she had me on a, uh, a platform and the time um, was, was stamped. So a lot of times I would go over, we would get cut off, I'd try and call her from the phone, but we would go over the one hour. She had a platform that only allowed me one hour, but we would still go over. And then it, there was like a, I don't know, like a, how do you call that? Like a five minute like grace period, if you will. And I'm, I would sometimes still be talking. And so I would call her on the phone outside of this platform to try and finish, you know, so we could kind of wrap up. But, you know, I would go on and I would exceed her time quite regularly. But, you know, I worked on it so we could get it get it down to, you know, the 50, the, to the one hour time frame. If I could turn your attention to the following two pages, 267 to 268, it is the final and fourth quarter report. It indicates that you attended nine therapy sessions. However, in between October 29th and November 12th, there's more than a seven day period gap. And in between November 12th and December 10th, Again, there is more than a seven day gap. Can you please elaborate or explain to the best of your recollection why there were no therapy sessions in those consecutive weeks? In the gap sessions, I did um, have the opportunity to email her and get responses from her. Um, it would have been her scheduling um, or her vacations, if you will. Um, but yes, um, I did continue with the emails and email responses from her for any, anything that I had um, any concerns about. One specific one was when my sister's um, husband was uh, apprehended and taken to prison. He was the one person that I wrote about. Um, as part of my submissions here, who had choked me until I blacked out. He was, he was molesting her underage, uh, as an underage person. He had recently, within this time frame, um, he had, uh, within the two year time frame, he had, he had uh, threatened to shoot me with a gun over the internet. And, um, and, my, and, and she, she, she asked me, you know, why would I want to report this? Why would I want to break the family? But I do remember that it was during this time that we were doing a lot of emailing back and forth. Um, and I think one of the weeks was one of the weeks where I could not get in touch, you know, couldn't see her face to face. So I do know that we do the emailing um, when we couldn't talk, but uh, she helped me with that. Um, he was put in prison, not for the abuse of my sister, but for 
many other women across the United States. Uh, they finally found him and convicted him as a, as a child molester. Turning your attention to the next page, which is 269, mm -hmm. it is titled the fourth quarter termination report, and it is the last report by your therapist. Please let me know when you're at that page. I'm at that page. Under the fourth paragraph there, it states, I recommend that Letha stay in therapy at least once a month, but she reports feeling like she wants to take a pause in therapy. Is there a reason why you chose not to continue therapy against the recommendation of your therapist? Financial burden. I, I don't have the money. I'm nearly bankrupt. I spent $1,100 a month for gas. So um, yeah, um, I had to take a loan against my 401k to pay for my board fees. Absolutely. Um, if I could have continued, I would have, but I couldn't. Turning back to your petition, going back to exhibit B1, if you could turn to that, it's page 59. B is in boy, B1, page 59. B is in boy? Yes, page 59. I'm here. The title of the document is, again, Petition for Early Termination and or Modification of Probation Therapy Information Sheet, Attachment D. Uh, at the bottom of the page, it indicates your therapist, the ones that we just went over, the quarterly reports. Is that correct? Yes, Dr. Tanika Gale. Is there a reason why this attachment is entirely blank and unsigned? Was this mine? Yes. OK, so I was supposed to fill this out. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm asking oh. you, what, to the best of your knowledge, why did you submit a blank therapy information sheet? Oh, it had to be, this had to be a duplicate of some kind. Like you, I filled something out for you guys to request the records from my therapist. So you had to receive that in order to request these records that you have, right? Okay, and Dr. Grayson, two things. One, this is counsel's opportunity to ask you questions, not the other way around. Okay. And if you don't know, it's fine to say you don't know. I mean, he's asking if you know why you submitted this document that's not signed or completed. If you have no knowledge of that, it's fine to say you don't know. We don't want you to assume or propose or make up reasons why it could have happened. Just tell us if you know why, and if you do not, it's fine to say that as well. I don't know why this was submitted. Okay. Blank. Okay. As a term of your probation, you were also required to undergo a psychological evaluation. Is that correct? Yes. If I could direct your attention, as well as the panel's attention and your honor's attention, to exhibit D8. And that's pages 229 through 256. Directing your attention specifically to page 245 of that report. Please let me know when you're there. The title is Discussion and Recommendations. Are you there, Dr. Grayson? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you. According to the evaluator, uh, she made several findings and recommendations that are contained in that page and the following two and a half pages thereafter. Did you have a chance to review them? No, not, not, in, not in detail. Okay. If I could just have you review that to yourself silently, those two and a half pages, and then let me know when you're done and I'll ask you a couple clarifying questions.
Okay, I'm done. Okay. Going back to page 245, the first page of the discussion and recommendations, the third paragraph down, the evaluator made the opinion that uh, you have a history of poor judgment and impulse control problems. Do you agree with that finding? It says our history does include indications of poor judgment and impulse control. I don't agree with that. Okay. The following paragraph has an opinion by the evaluator indicating that you do not directly express remorse for your past criminal conduct, rather that you attribute your difficulties mainly to other people. Do you agree or disagree with that evaluator's opinion in that paragraph? I agree with that. Directing your attention to page 246, mm -hmm. the last paragraph by the evaluator, she assesses and makes the assessment, uh, what is lacking is an adequate self-awareness which has, which has made it difficult for you to acknowledge your contribution to mistakes and engage in self-care necessary for psychological stability and stress management. Do you agree or disagree with that assessment? I agree. I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. All right, thank you very much. Now would be our time for questions from the board. Let's start with uh, President Tate, please. No questions, thank you. All right, Vice President Fu. No further questions. All right, Dr. Kasuga. I just have one question. Um, so I understand that uh, the hardship that the probation has caused you, but um, for this, for the purposes of this petition hearing, um, we're trying to figure out whether you've met the burden for rehabilitation. So my question is, how would you define rehabilitation and whether you have met that? Um, I think there was a lot of clarifying um, experiences that I was able to uh, engage in and with through the rehabilitation, um, having the therapy and um, being able to work with, you know, my supervisor. Um, I believe that, you know, a lot of self-awareness, boundaries, um, ways of coping, um, has attributed to my ability to be less impulsive, to be able to take care of myself, to be able to um, use coping skills that maybe I had not discovered before. Um, I think that this experience has been a great experience um, for self-awareness, um, for, for responsibility, for accountability, um, not just for for others, but for myself, for my history, for who I am. Um, I did detail um, uh, um, uh, mental illness running in my family and not, not, not even knowing that um, or investigating that until I had therapy. And so I think just to know that, wow, some of those things that I, I did experience, those things that were part of my presentation before I had therapy, those were things, those were actual. And so now looking back as, as the uh, deputy um, uh, pointed out, yes, those were things that I can say were a part of me before I had my therapy, before that awareness, that great awareness took place. And now it's caused me to, to, to be able to see people in a different light, see myself in a different light. Um, be responsible for how I cope. Be responsible for you know what actions I may take and how they may affect others. That that has been a big. It's been just great. It's been just a great way to just engage in life. It's it's just allowed me to just be able to engage with not just others, but with myself at a different level. And so looking back, I think, I think this process has been a great process. Of course it's been, you know, the driving and not being able to work a job closer to my house, but I think overall, I think the board made a good decision. I think some of the things that I needed to experience or needed to know or needed to investigate or curiously um, look at has caused me to be a person that was much different 
two years ago or almost three years ago now. Thank you, Dr. Grayson. Thank you. Dr. Cervantes. Thank you. Um, I just have one question. Our responsibility as a board is to California consumers. Of all the documents we've been discussing over the last several hours and your testimony, what can you tell us um, to speak to um, how you practice, how you have been rehabilitated to be a, um, to practice safely um, um, the practice of psychology. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Um, I, I would like to say, um, first and foremost, um, where I practice, I think, is really a great testing ground for what I do and maybe even some of the um, requirements for having those boundaries, for having the, um, the thought of engagement before, so a forethought, um, to deal with people, um, to know and understand that a complaint if it were to come about, is something that should be looked at, um, or that um, someone who who has maybe has said something. For instance, our reporting requirements. Uh, I think those are very important to curiously look at um, to make sure that the that the consumer is being protected. Um, Regarding and that regards my responsibility to respect that consumer. So our reporting laws. I had extra classes on that. That was that's this. It's an immense help. Um, um, we also. I also deal with you know people who who aren't safe particularly um, to be able to engage with that person in a way that's safe um, and that's respectful and that's humane, um, is very important to the consumer as a whole. Um, we're all consumers. And in order, to, um, in order to give a service or be of service, I think it takes that, that awareness of oneself um, to be able to be safe in order to give a quality service um, to people who may be seeking that service or paying for that service or wishing to benefit from that service. Thank you. I have no questions, no further questions. All right, Dr. Sheets. Thank you, Dr. Grayson. Um, I wanted to ask, in your um, statement about why your license should be granted, um, one statement you made was that you were volunteering several hours a week with uh, patients at your facility and that this was on your own time um, and you provide extra help outside of work hours. Could you tell us what you do with those patients? Um, I provide interventions. Um, so we have, um, we have a large cabinet of things that can help our patients. Um, and uh, let's say a patient is telling me they're having issues with their self-esteem. They feel they hate themselves. They they don't they don't love themselves. They don't they can't find a way. And, and this particular this with this particular patient, I would go through and find um, different um, interventions that we have listed in our our cabinet. Go through with them some different ways of maybe promoting self-compassion or promoting self-love, and I would sit with them and engage with them and help them to be better. Okay. So in a sense, you're extending the therapy. Extending the therapy, yes. Okay. Um, and in, on the, um, dis the disciplinary action information sheet, um, you were asked about restitution. 
And you said for the second case, I was asked to repay the $1,495 for each of the two convictions. So did you, were you able to pay that? Yes, of course, yes, I paid that, yes. Okay, okay. Um, and my last question was, you, you've talked about if your, term, if your probation was terminated, that you would be able to work at a position closer to your home. And I, I'm not sure if I heard correctly, but it, you said you weren't able to now because the person who's supervising you is not at that location. And I thought maybe you were saying you wouldn't necessarily need a supervisor if your term, if your probation was terminated. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, after I passed my exam, I wouldn't need I wouldn't need a supervisor if I passed after I passed my exam. I'm a I'm an associate psychologist at this time. Uh -huh. um, and um, no, with my license being on probation, I have not been successful at getting another job anywhere. Uh, one of the requirements is that your license be in good standing. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the supervisor, uh, 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 um, I would have to have a psychologist supervisor that would be willing to take on my license. Mm -hmm. And the only one that I've found is the one that I'm working with. And I work with her as an intern, so you know, uh, I don't have, I, no one else will take my license as it is right now. I understand, yes. I understand. Thank you for that clarification. I have no more questions. I have no questions at this time, thank you. I have no questions. All right, uh, Member Riscate. Thank you, Dr. Grayson. I just have one question. After the incident um, with your son, what happened after that? Was he taken away, or did you end up having the incident and then just go right back to taking care of him and living together? Well, he didn't want to uh, live with me, um, which was uh, his his decision. Um, but I no, he was not taken away. I did not lose custody. Um, but I did want him to be with people who I knew cared for him, cared about him. So he went to live with one of my ex-partners who um, cared for him right here in Sacramento until he was 18. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Rogers. Hi, Dr. Grayson. Thank you for being here. I have no questions. Thank you. All right, so is there anything that you've thought of, uh, Dr. Grayson, based on the questions that you've been asked that you would like to add? Sometimes when being questioned, people think of things they meant to say but did not. Is there anything else? Yes, um, I was thinking about the question where you said, um, uh, Deputy, um, that I did not want to, that I, that I didn't want to take the blame. Uh, there was an, an excerpt about me not taking the blame. I fully, take the blame for what happened um, with the real estate, uh, with respect or with regard to the real estate uh, situation where the employee okay. did and the I'm wrongdoing. Jump in here quickly and maybe yes. I should clarify. I want to know if you have any additional facts about what occurred that you would like to add based on what you've been asked. You will have the opportunity to make a closing argument where you oh. can okay. essentially make the statement I think you were just about to make about accepting responsibility and rehabilitation. I just okay. want to know if there are any additional facts that we haven't talked about that you think might be important. Any facts? Um, no, I can't think of any at this time. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Any additional questions, counsel? All right, so with there that you said, you are no longer testifying. I think now will be the appropriate time um, to make any closing argument that you may have. Would you like to do that at this time? Okay. Um, yes. Um, I wanted to say um, uh, with regard to not accepting blame um, for each of the two um, offenses that um, the board has, has um, put my license on restriction for. I had personally um, walked into a police station to, uh, to try and allay the whatever was going on, try and take care of it. And so um, in the first incident with my son, I called the police in the second incident with the licensing because I did not know it was a particular issue. Um, 
but I did walk into the police station. So I want, I, I want to make that very clear. No one has come and put me into jail or done any of that without me sit, taking and saying, okay, this is something that I understand that you know is wrong. Um, and so that was with the real estate case with my son. I did call the police. Things happened there that uh, were uh, uh, not okay. Uh, and I do, I do understand that there was some consistency of my statement. But I do want to say, as I have said before, and that that is in the document, that that was not without me reporting uh, being threatened by the police at my home. Um, so that is in the record. Um, um, also, um, I would like to also say that you know my work is is it's what I love to do. Um, I've never had any issues. I've never had any problems. I've never used any drugs. I've never drank any alcohol. I, I, I don't. I don't use any of these things in my work or outside of my work or in my home. Um, so um, I have grown, and I think again, as deputy, as the deputy pointed out, um, with the um, mental status exam, there were some things, some issues, some some self-awareness, boundary issues, maybe some impulsivity issues. Those things, I think, I was able to definitely. Um, identify, um, investigate uh, curiously, and, and accept and um, work with. And I will continue to work with those boundaries. I will continue to work with those things that have been brought to my attention so that I can better serve the public and be a better person to myself. That's all I have to say. Thank right, you. Thank you. Would you like to make a recommendation at this point, Mr. Lint? Yes, Your Honor. Please proceed. Thank you. The practice of psychology in California affects the public health, safety, and welfare, and is the subject to be a uh, subject of regulation and control in the public interest to protect the public from either unauthorized or unqualified individuals who practice psychology and from unprofessional conduct as well. In addition, the protection of the public shall be the highest priority for the Board of Psychology in exercising its licensing regulatory and disciplinary functions. Whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall always be paramount. The standard today that the petitioner must meet is that of clear and convincing evidence of rehabilitation. And in deciding whether to grant a petition for early termination of probation, among other things, the board must consider the nature and severity of the acts or crimes under consideration as grounds for denial. And here, the nature and severity of the acts that the petitioner committed are self-evident. The petitioner engaged in an act of child abuse and cruelty in December of 2002, and two separate felonious acts of grand theft in April of 2009. The petitioner was approximately 31 years of age when she, convict, when she was convicted in 2002, and was 38 years old in 2009, and thus cannot claim that such crimes were either youthful indiscretions the criminal convictions spanning seven years demonstrate both seriousness of nature as well as moral turpitude. In each instance, petitioner either served time in jail or was placed on criminal probation with terms and conditions. Rehabilitation is evaluated according to an internal subjective measure of attitude, a state of mind, if you will, as well as an external objective measurement of conduct, statement of facts. State of mind demonstrating rehabilitation is one that has mature, measured, and appreciation of the gravity of the misconduct as well as remorse for the harm that was caused. The petitioner must take responsibility for the misconduct and show an appreciation for why it is wrong. Petitioner must also show a demonstration course of conduct that convinces and assures the board that the public would be safe if the petitioner is permitted to be licensed to practice psychology without supervision. In 2020, the psychological evaluation of the petitioner concluded that the petitioner has a history of poor judgment and impulse control problems. That petitioner failed to directly express remorse for her past criminal conduct and rather attributes her difficulties mainly to other people and is lacking an adequate self-awareness that has made it difficult for her to acknowledge her contribution and mistakes and engage in self-care necessary for psychological stability and stress management. 
Petitioner's quarterly psychotherapy progress summaries do not demonstrate that petitioner complied directly with the terms of probation. Petitioner failed to attend 52 consecutive weeks of therapy with at least four unaccounted for sessions. There is no indication in the documents for the duration that each session lasted a minimum of one hour either. Petitioner's psychiatrist's final report also recommended that the petitioner continue to attend therapy for at least once a month since December of 2021. However, she has not done so. Consequently, the Attorney General's Office remains deeply concerned that the period petitioner has been on active probation is an insufficient amount of time to adequately and properly address the rehabilitative issues identified in her psychological evaluation and that continue to persist in her psychotherapy. It is also concerning that petitioner has spent the majority of her submitted petition and documentation as well as testimony today talking about her childhood trauma as well as talking about her current work conditions. It seems as though there is a high value placed on her commute and demands of her current job. Her significant other, Ms. Barron, testified strictly as to her ability to work with a clear focus and the amount of hours that she works. There is no letter of support or character letter authored by that individual. There is no testimony authored by that individual that goes to either the rehabilitation of the petitioner, a knowledge base of the petitioner's prior misconduct, compliance with terms and conditions, or even at a very minimum, a support system that that individual would offer the petitioner if put under similar stresses in the future. There is simply an absence of any testimony or evidence to that effect. Additionally, petitioner hasn't really addressed efforts of rehabilitation or how she has changed her behavior since being on probation. Rather, she deflects responsibility for her criminal conduct onto others rather than the circumstances that gave rise to the conduct. These efforts by petitioner in both her petition as well as today substantiate the conclusions of the psychological evaluation in that petitioner has failed to directly express remorse for her past criminal conduct and rather attributes her difficulties to other people and is lacking an adequate self-awareness that has made it difficult for her to acknowledge her contribution to mistakes and engage in self-care necessities. Given these circumstances and the fact that the petitioner exhibits only a limited amount of insight into the past misconduct, the Attorney General's Office recommends that the Board deny this petition. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that said, the matter is submitted and we are off the record. Thank you, Dr. Grayson. Let's take a 10 minute break and we will resume at 515 for our petition hearing. Thank you.